While it is true that most of the common pain experiences people have appear to be due to the disorder I am about to describe, one must be absolutely sure that nothing serious is going on. I have rarely seen a patient with pain in the neck, shoulders, back, or buttocks who didn't believe that the pain was due to an injury, a hurt brought on by some physical activity. I hurt myself while running. The pain started after I lifted my little girl, or when I tried to open a stuck window, or perhaps ten years ago I was involved in a hit-from-behind auto accident, and I've had recurrent back pain ever since. The idea that pain means injury or damage is deeply ingrained in the American consciousness. Of course, if the pain starts while one is engaged in a physical activity, it's difficult not to attribute the pain to that activity. But this pervasive concept of the vulnerability of the back, of ease of injury, is nothing less than a medical catastrophe for the American public. We now have an army of semi-disabled men and women whose lives are significantly restricted by the fear of doing further damage or bringing on the dreaded pain again. One often hears, I'm afraid of hurting myself again, so I'm going to be very careful of what I do. In good faith, this idea has been fostered by the medical profession and other healers for years. It has been assumed, without scientific validation of these diagnostic concepts, that neck, shoulder, back, and buttock pain is due to injury or disease of the spine and associated structures, or due to incompetence of muscles and ligaments surrounding these structures. On the other hand, I have had gratifying success in the treatment of these disorders for 27 years, based on a very different diagnosis. It has been my observation that the majority of these pain syndromes are the result of a condition in the muscles or nerves or tendons brought on by tension. And the point has been proven by the very high rate of success achieved with a treatment program that is simple, rapid, and thorough. Medicine's preoccupation with the spine draws on fundamental medical philosophy and training. Modern medicine has been primarily mechanical and structural in orientation. The body is viewed as an exceedingly complex machine, and illness is seen as a malfunction in the machine, brought about by infection, trauma, inherited defects, degeneration, and, of course, cancer. At the same time, medical science has had a love affair with the laboratory, believing that nothing is valid unless it can be demonstrated in that arena. No one would dispute the essential role the laboratory has played in medical progress. Witness penicillin and insulin, for example. Unfortunately, some things are difficult to study at the laboratory. One of these is the mind and its organ, the brain. The emotions do not lend themselves to test tube experiments and measurement, and so modern medical science has chosen to ignore them, buttressed by the conviction that emotions have little to do with health and illness anyway. My concept currently is that rage in the unconscious, which incidentally I believe to be universal in our society, is the emotion that necessitates physical symptoms like pain. The purpose of the pain is to make sure that the rage does not escape repression and become overt. Anxiety and depression are equivalents to the pain, since they, too, are reactions to the unconscious rage. The same may be said for phobias, panic reactions, and obsessive-compulsive disorders, also equivalents of the pain, reactions to the unconscious rage. Still, the majority of practicing physicians do not consider that emotions play a significant role in causing physical disorders, though many would acknowledge that they might aggravate a physically caused illness. In general, physicians feel uncomfortable in dealing with a problem that is related to the emotions. They tend to make a sharp division between the things of the mind and the things of the body, and only feel comfortable with the latter. Peptic ulcer of the duodenum is a good example. Although most physicians would claim that peptic ulcers are due to bacteria, 
It is my view that emotional factors are still the precipitating cause of the ulcer and that the presence of bacteria is only part of the process. Contrary to logic, however, the major focus in treatment is medical, not psychological, and drugs are prescribed to neutralize or prevent the secretion of acid. But failure to treat the primary cause of the disorder is poor medicine. It is symptomatic treatment, something we were warned about in medical school. But since most physicians see their role only as treating the body, the psychological part of the problem is neglected, even though it's the basic cause. In fairness, some physicians make an attempt to say something about tension, but it's often of a superficial nature like, you ought to take it easy, you're working too hard. Pain syndromes look so physical, it is especially difficult for doctors to consider the possibility that they might be caused by psychological factors, and so they cling to the structural explanation. In doing so, however, they are chiefly responsible for the pain epidemic that now exists in this country. If structural abnormalities don't cause pain in the neck, shoulder, back, and buttocks, what does? Studies and clinical experience of many years suggest that these common pain syndromes are the result of a physiologic alteration in certain muscles, nerves, tendons, and ligaments. This alteration is called the tension myositis syndrome, or TMS. Myo means muscle. Tension myositis syndrome is defined here as a change of state in a muscle or nerve or tendon that is painful. It's a harmless but potentially very painful disorder that is the result of specific common emotional situations. It's the purpose of this program to describe TMS in detail. Who gets TMS? One might almost say that TMS is a cradle-to-grave disorder since it does occur in children, though probably not until the age of five or six. Its manifestation in children is, of course, different from what occurs in adults. I'm convinced that what are referred to as growing pains in children are manifestations of TMS. The cause of growing pains has never been identified, but physicians have always been comfortable in reassuring mothers that the condition is harmless. It occurred to me one day while listening to a young mother describe the severe leg pain her daughter had suffered in the middle of the night that what the child had experienced was very much like an adult attack of sciatica. And since this was clearly one of the most common manifestations of TMS, growing pains might very well represent TMS in children. Little wonder that no one has been able to explain the nature of growing pains since TMS is a condition that usually leaves no physical evidence of its presence. There is a temporary constriction of blood vessels, bringing on the symptoms, and then all returns to normal. The emotional stimulus for the attack in children is no different from that in adults, something psychological. One might say that the attack in a child is a paranightmare. It is a substitute for a nightmare, a command decision by the mind to produce a physical reaction rather than have the individual experience a painful emotion, which is what happens in adults as well. At the other end of the spectrum, I have seen the syndrome in men and women in their 80s. There appears to be no age limit. And why would there be? As long as one can generate emotions, one is susceptible to the disorder. What are the ages when it is most common, and can we learn anything from those statistics? In a follow-up survey carried out in 1982, 177 patients were interviewed as to their then-current status following treatment for TMS. We learned that 77% of the patients fell between the ages of 30 and 60. 9% were in their 20s. Only 2% were teenagers. At the other end of the spectrum, 7% were in their 60s and 4% in their 70s. These statistics suggest very strongly that the cause of most back pain is emotional for the years between 30 and 60 are the ages that fall into what I would call the years of responsibility. This is the period in one's life when one is under the most strain to succeed, 
to provide and excel, and it's logical that this is when one would experience the highest incidence of TMS. Further, if degenerative changes in the spine, like osteoarthritis, disc degeneration and herniation, facet arthrosis and spinal stenosis, if these were a primary cause of back pain, these statistics wouldn't fit at all. In that case, a gradual increase in incidence from the 20s on would occur, with the highest incidence in the oldest people. To be sure, this is only circumstantial evidence, but it is highly suggestive. So the answer to the question, who gets TMS, is anybody. But it is certainly most common in the middle years of life, the years of responsibility. Let's take a look at how TMS manifests itself. The primary tissue involved in TMS is muscle, hence the original name myositis. Remember, myo stands for muscle. The only muscles in the body that are susceptible to TMS are those in the back of the neck, the entire back, and the buttocks, known collectively as postural muscles. They are so named because they maintain the correct posture of the head and trunk and contribute to the effective use of the arms. Postural muscles have a higher proportion of slow-twitch muscle fibers than arm or leg muscles. This makes them more efficient for endurance activity, which is what is required of them. Whether or not this is the reason why TMS is restricted to this group of muscles, we do not know. It is possible, though, since the muscles most frequently involved have the most important jobs. These are the buttock muscles, known anatomically as gluteal muscles. Their job is to keep the trunk upright on the legs, to prevent it from falling forward or to either side. Statistically, the low back buttock area is the most common location for TMS. Just above the buttocks are the lumbar muscles in the small of the back, often involved simultaneously with buttock muscles. Occasionally, the gluteal or lumbar muscles are affected separately. Roughly two-thirds of TMS patients will have their major pain in this area. Second in order of frequency of involvement are the neck and shoulder muscles. The pain is usually in the side of the neck and the top of the shoulder in the upper trapezius muscle. TMS can occur anywhere else in the back between the shoulders and low back, but does so far less frequently than in the two areas I mentioned. Generally, a patient will complain of pain in one of these prime areas, as, for example, in the left buttock or the right shoulder, but the physical examination will reveal something else of great interest and importance. In virtually every patient with TMS, one finds tenderness when pressure is applied to muscles in three parts of the back, the outer aspect of both buttocks and sometimes to the entire buttock, the muscles in the lumbar area, and both upper trapezius or shoulder muscles. This consistent pattern is important because it supports the hypothesis that the pain syndrome originates in the brain rather than in some structural abnormality of the spine or incompetence of the muscle. The second type of tissue to be implicated in this syndrome is nerve tissue, specifically what are known as peripheral nerves. Those most frequently affected are located, as might be expected, in close proximity to the muscles that are involved most often. The sciatic nerve is located deep in the buttock muscle, one on each side. Lumbar spinal nerves are under the lumbar paraspinal muscles. The cervical spinal nerves and brachial plexus are under the upper trapezius muscles. These are the nerves most frequently affected in TMS. In fact, TMS looks like a regional process, rather than one aimed at specific structures. So when it affects a given area, all the tissues suffer oxygen deprivation so that one may experience both muscle and nerve pain. Varying kinds of pain may result when muscle and or nerve are affected. It may be sharp, aching, burning, shock-like, or it may feel like pressure. In addition to pain, nerve involvement may produce feelings of pins and needles, tingling and or numbness, 
and sometimes sensations of weakness in the legs or arms. In some cases, there is measurable muscle weakness. This can be documented with electromyographic studies. Electromyographic or EMG abnormalities are often cited as evidence of nerve damage due to structural compression, but in fact, EMG changes are very common in TMS and usually reveal involvement of many more nerves than could be explained by a structural abnormality. Lumbar spinal and sciatic nerve symptoms are in the legs, for that is where those nerves are going. Involvement of cervical spinal nerves and brachial plexus cause symptoms in the arms and hands. Traditional diagnoses attribute leg pain to a herniated disc and arm pain to a, quote, pinched nerve. TMS may involve any of the nerves in the neck, shoulders, back, and buttocks, sometimes producing unusual pain patterns. One of the most frightening is chest pain. One immediately thinks of the heart when there is chest pain, and indeed, it is always important to be sure that there's nothing wrong with that organ. Once having done so, one should keep in mind that spinal nerves in the upper back may be suffering mild oxygen deprivation because of TMS, and that this may be the source of the pain. These nerves serve the front of the trunk as well as the back, hence the chest pain. Remember, always consult a regular physician in order to rule out serious disorders. This program is not intended as a guide to self-diagnosis. Its purpose is to describe a clinical entity, TMS. One may suspect the presence of nerve involvement in TMS through the patient's history, a physical examination, or both. Sciatic pain may affect any part of the leg except the upper front thigh. There is considerable variability depending on how much of the nerve trunk is affected by oxygen debt. As noted, the person may also complain of other strange feelings and of weakness. On physical examination, the tendon reflexes and muscle strength are tested to determine whether oxygen deprivation has irritated the nerve sufficiently to interfere with the transmission of motor impulses. Similarly, sensory tests are done. For example, ability to feel a pinprick to determine the integrity of the sensory fibers in the involved nerve. The major virtue of documenting sensory or motor deficits is to be able to discuss them with patients and reassure them that feelings of weakness, numbness, or tingling are quite harmless. The so-called straight leg raising test is always done when a patient is examined, though for different reasons depending on the examiner. If there is a great deal of soreness in the buttocks, the patient will be unable to elevate the straightened leg very far, and then only with a great deal of pain. The pain may be due to the muscle, the sciatic nerve, or both. What the sign does not mean in the majority of cases is that there is a herniated disc, quote, pressing on the sciatic nerve, as patients are often told. When there is a shoulder arm pain syndrome, one does similar tests on the arm and hand. Sometimes patients have pain on two sides. This is of no particular significance. People will also often report that in addition to having the major pain in the right buttock and leg, for example, they have some intermittent pain in the neck or one of the shoulders. This is not unexpected, since TMS may involve any or all of the postural muscles. Following the publication of my first book describing TMS, I gradually became aware that a variety of tendinalgias, pain in tendons or ligaments, were probably part of the syndrome of tension myositis. The term myositis was fast becoming obsolete, it having been determined many years before that nerves could be implicated in TMS, as just described. Now I was beginning to realize that still another type of tissue might be part of the process, and as time went by, this conclusion became more and more inescapable. What first attracted attention were reports from treated patients. In addition to the disappearance of back pain, their tendon pain, for example, tennis elbow, often went as well. 
As is well known, tennis elbow is one of the most common of the disorders called tendonitis. Generally, it is assumed that these painful tendons are inflamed, probably because of excessive activity. The routine treatment is anti-inflammatory medication and activity restriction. Having been alerted to the possibility that these painful tendons might be part of TMS, I began to suggest to patients that their tendonitis might also disappear if they allowed it to occupy the same place in their thinking as the back pain. The results were encouraging, and over time, my confidence in the diagnosis increased. I am now prepared to say that tendonalgia is often an integral part of TMS, and in some cases is its primary manifestation. It has become apparent that the elbow is not the most common site of tendonalgia. In my experience, the knee has that distinction. Some of the usual diagnoses for knee pain are chondromalacia, unstable kneecap, trauma, and a torn cartilage. However, the examination discloses that there is tenderness of one or more of the tendons and ligaments surrounding the knee joint, and the pain usually disappears along with the back pain. Another common place is the foot and ankle, either the top or bottom of the foot, or the Achilles tendon. Common foot diagnoses are neuroma, bone spur, plantar fasciitis, flat feet, and trauma due to excessive physical activity. The shoulder is another location for TMS tendonalgia. The usual structural diagnosis is bursitis or rotator cuff disorder. Again, there is usually easily identified tenderness on palpation of a tendon in the shoulder. Wrist tendons are not uncommonly involved. It is likely that what is known as carpal tunnel syndrome may also be part of TMS. Recently, I saw a patient who had developed pain in a new location after a minor accident. She said that the pain was in her hip and that x-rays showed that there was arthritis of the hip joints, more on the side where she was having pain. She had been told that this was the cause of her pain. She had proven to be highly susceptible to TMS in the past, so I suggested she come in for an examination. The x-rays showed a very modest amount of arthritic change in the joint in question. She had excellent range of motion of the joint and no pain on weight-bearing or movement of the leg. When I asked her to touch the exact spot where she felt the pain, she identified a small area where the tendon of a muscle attaches to bone well above the hip joint. It was tender to pressure. I told her I thought she had TMS tendonalgia and the pain left in a few days. TMS can manifest itself in a variety of locations and it tends to move around, particularly if something is being done to combat the disorder. Patients often report pain in a new location as the old one gets better. It is as though the brain is unwilling to give up this convenient strategy for diverting attention away from the realm of the emotions. It is therefore particularly important for the patient to know where all the possible locations of pain are. My patients are routinely instructed to call me when they develop new pain so that we can determine whether it is part of TMS. In summary, TMS involves three types of tissue, muscle, nerve, and tendon-ligaments. Let us now look at how TMS manifests itself. When first seen, most people are under the impression that they have been suffering from the long-term results of an injury, a degenerative process, a congenital abnormality, or some deficiency in the strength or flexibility of their muscles. The idea of injury is probably the most pervasive. This often ties in with the circumstances under which the pain begins. According to a survey we did a number of years ago, 40% of a typical group of patients reported that the pain began in association with some kind of physical incident. For some, it was a minor automobile accident, usually the hit-from-behind type. Falls on the ice or down steps were common. Lifting a heavy object or straining was another. And, of course, running, tennis, golf, or basketball 
were often blamed. The pain began anywhere from minutes to hours or days after the incident, raising some important questions about the nature of the pain. Some of the reported incidents were trivial, such as bending over to pick up a toothbrush or twisting to reach into a cupboard. But the ensuing pain might be just as excruciating as that experienced by someone who is trying to lift a refrigerator. I recall a young man who was sitting at his office desk writing and experienced a spasm in his low back so severe and persistent that he had to be taken home by ambulance. The next 48 hours were agonizing. He couldn't move without setting off a new wave of spasm. How can such excruciating pain be set off by this great variety of physical incidents? In view of the different degrees of severity of the physical incidents and the great variation in when the pain begins after the incident, the conclusion is that the physical happening was not the cause of the pain, but was merely a trigger. Many patients apparently don't need a trigger. The pain just comes on gradually, or they awaken with it in the morning. In the survey mentioned above, 60% fell into that category. The idea that physical incidents are triggers is reinforced by the fact that there is no way to distinguish between those pains that start gradually and those that begin dramatically in terms of subsequent severity or longevity of the attack. All of this makes perfect sense when one considers the nature of TMS. Despite the perception of injury, patients are not injured. The physical occurrence has given the brain the opportunity to begin an attack of TMS. There is another reason to doubt the role of injury in these attacks of back pain. One of the most powerful systems that has evolved over the millions of years of life on this planet is the biologic capacity for healing, for restoration. Our body parts tend to heal very quickly when they are injured. Even the largest bone in the body, the femur, only takes six weeks to heal. And during that process, there is pain for only a very short time. It is illogical to think that an injury that occurred two months ago might still be causing pain, not to mention one or two or ten years ago. And yet people have been so thoroughly indoctrinated with the idea of persistent injury that they accept it without question. Invariably, those patients who have a gradual onset of pain will attribute it to a physical incident that may have occurred years before, like an automobile or skiing accident because in their minds back pain is physical, that is, structural. It must be due to an injury. As far as they are concerned, there has to be a physical cause. This idea is one of the great impediments in the way of recovery. It must be resolved in the patient's mind or the pain will persist. Gradually, patients need to begin to think psychologically. And, indeed, once the diagnosis of TMS is made, it is common for patients to begin to recall all of the psychological things that were going on in their lives when acute attacks occurred, like starting a new job, getting married, an illness in the family, a financial crisis, and so on. Or, the patient will acknowledge that he or she has always been a worrier overly conscientious and responsible, compulsive and perfectionistic, and or has a strong need to be liked and to be helpful to others. This is the beginning of wisdom, the start of the process of putting things into proper perspective. In this case, it is the recognition that there are physical disorders that play a psychological role in human biology. Not to be aware of that fact, is to doom oneself to perpetual pain and disability. Perhaps the most common and undoubtedly the most frightening manifestation of TMS is the acute attack. It usually comes out of the blue, and the pain is often excruciating. The most common location for these attacks is the low back, involving the lumbar muscles at the small of the back, the buttock muscles, or both. Any movement brings on a new wave of terrible pain, so the condition is very upsetting, to say the least. It is clear 
that the involved muscles have gone into spasm. Spasm is a state of extreme contraction of the muscles, an abnormal condition that may be horrifically painful. Most everyone has experienced a leg or foot cramp, a charley horse, which is the same thing, except that the cramp will stop as soon as the involved muscle is stretched. The spasm of an attack of TMS does not let up. When it begins to ease, any movement can start it up again. I believe that oxygen deprivation is responsible for the spasm as well as other kinds of pain characteristic of TMS. It is likely that leg cramps also result from oxygen deprivation. This is why they usually occur in bed when the circulation of blood is slowed down and there is liable to be a temporary minor state of reduced oxygenation in the leg muscles. Blood flow can be quickly restored to normal with muscle contraction. With TMS, however, reduced blood flow is continued by action of the autonomic nerves and the abnormal muscle state persists. People often report that at the moment of onset they hear some kind of noise, a crack, a snap, or a pop. Patients often use the phrase, my back went out. They're sure that something is broken. In fact, nothing breaks, but the patient will swear that there has been some kind of structural damage. The noise is a mystery. It may be that it is similar to the noise elicited by a manipulation of the spine, which is a kind of cracking the knuckles of the joints of the spinal bones. One thing is clear. The noise indicates nothing harmful. Though the lower back is the most common location for an acute attack, it can occur anywhere in the neck, shoulders, or upper and lower back. Wherever it occurs, it is the most painful thing I know of in clinical medicine, which is ironic because it is completely harmless. Not uncommonly, the trunk is distorted by one of these attacks. It may be bent forward or to the side or a bit of both. It is undoubtedly an automatic reaction to the pain. Naturally, it's very disturbing, but it has no special significance. These episodes last for varying periods of time and invariably leave the person with a sense of dread and apprehension. The common perception is that something terrible has happened and that it is important to be very careful not to do anything that will injure the back and bring on another attack. If the low back pain is accompanied by pain in the leg or sciatica, there is even greater concern and apprehension, for this raises the specter of herniated disc and the possibility of surgery. In this media-dominated age, very few people have not heard of herniated discs, and the idea arouses great anxiety, resulting in greater pain. If, in the course of medical investigation, imaging studies show a herniation, the apprehension is multiplied even further. And if there should be feelings of numbness or tingling in the leg or foot and or weakness, all of which can occur with TMS because of burgeoning fear, the conditions for a very protracted episode of pain are defined. As we'll discuss later, herniated discs are rarely the cause of the pain. There is not a great deal one can do to speed the resolution of such an episode. If the person is fortunate enough to know what is going on, that this is only a muscle spasm and there is nothing structurally wrong, the attack will be short-lived, but this is rarely the case. I advise my patients to remain quietly in bed, perhaps take a strong painkiller, and not agonize over what has happened. They are further instructed to keep testing their ability to move around and not assume that they are going to be immobilized for days or weeks. If one can overcome one's apprehension, the duration of the attack will be considerably shorter. In over half the cases of TMS, the pain begins gradually. There is no dramatic episode. In some cases, there is no physical incident to which one can attribute the pain. In others, onset of pain may follow a physical happening, but hours, days, or even weeks later. This pattern is fairly common after a so-called whiplash incident. Your car is struck from behind, and your head snaps back. Examination and x-rays do not reveal a fracture or dislocation, 
but sometime thereafter pain begins, usually in the neck and shoulders, occasionally in the mid or low back. Pain in an arm or hand may also occur. And, like sciatica, this pain arouses a great deal of anxiety. Sometimes the pain begins in the neck and shoulders and then moves down to involve the rest of the back. If one knows that this is TMS, the course may be relatively brief. If some sort of structural diagnosis is made, symptoms may continue for many months despite treatment. Whether acute attack or slow onset, why does the pain begin when it does? Remember, the physical incident, no matter how dramatic, is a trigger. The answer, of course, is to be found in one's psychological state. Sometimes the reason is obvious, a financial or health crisis, or something one ordinarily thinks of as a happy occasion, like getting married or the birth of a child. I've had a number of highly competitive people whose pain began in the course of athletic competition, like a tennis match. Naturally, they assumed that they had hurt themselves. When they realized they had TMS, they admitted how very anxious they had been about the competition. It is not the occasion itself, but the emotional reaction which it generates that determines if there will be a physical reaction. The important thing is the emotion generated and repressed, for we have a built-in tendency to repress unpleasant, painful, or embarrassing emotions. These repressed feelings are the stimulus for TMS and other disorders like it. Experience has shown that rage is the most important emotion that we would rather not be aware of, and so the mind keeps it in the subterranean precincts of the unconscious mind if it possibly can. Then there's the person who says, There was absolutely nothing going on in my life when this began. But when we begin to discuss the trials and tribulations of daily life, it is usually clear that this person is generating unconscious emotions all the time. I think there is a gradual build-up in such people until a threshold is reached, at which point the symptoms begin. Once it is pointed out to them, these patients have little trouble recognizing that they are the kind of goodest or perfectionist, highly responsible people who generate a lot of unconscious anger in response to the pressures of everyday life. There is another interesting pattern that we see very often, which is the delayed onset reaction. In these cases, patients go through a highly stressful period that may last for weeks or months, such as an illness in the family or a financial crisis. They are physically fine as they live through the trouble, but one or two weeks after it's all over, they have an attack of back pain, either acute or slow onset. It seems as though they rise to the occasion and do whatever they have to do to deal with the trouble. But once it's over, the accumulated anger slash rage threatens to overwhelm them, and so the pain begins. Another way of looking at it is that they don't have time to be sick during the crisis. All of their emotional energy goes into coping with the trouble. A third possibility is that the crisis or stressful situation is providing enough emotional pain and distraction that a physical pain isn't necessary. The pain syndrome seems to function to divert the person's attention away from repressed, undesirable emotions like rage. When one is living through a crisis, there is more than enough unpleasantness going on and one has no need for a distraction. Whatever the psychological explanation, this is a common pattern, and it is important to recognize it so that the back pain will not be blamed on some, quote, physical condition. When we generate anger, depends mostly on the details of our personality structure. Some people report that they almost always have an attack of pain when they're on vacation. Or if they already have pain, they'll report that it gets worse on weekends. For some, the reason is obvious. They are very anxious about their work or business when they're away from it. It's a bit like the delayed reaction. As long as they are on the job, they may be burning up the tension. But when they are away from it, supposedly relaxing, 
the tension accumulates. Speaking of relaxing, one often hears the advice, relax, as though that's something one can do voluntarily. There are also numerous techniques around for promoting relaxation, like drugs, meditation, and biofeedback, to name a few. However, unless the relaxation process succeeds in reducing repressed anger, people will develop things like TMS and tension headaches despite the attempt to induce relaxation. Some people don't know how to leave their daily concerns behind them and shift attention to something pleasurable. I remember a patient who said that her pain would invariably begin when she got herself a drink and sat down to relax. Essential to an understanding of TMS and what happens over time if one continues to be plagued by this disorder is knowledge about a very important phenomenon known as conditioning. A more modern term meaning the same thing is programming. All animals, including humans, are conditionable. The phenomenon is best known by the experiment reported by the Russian physiologist Pavlov who is credited with the discovery of conditioning. One of his experiments demonstrated that animals develop associations which can produce automatic and reproducible physical reactions. In the research study, he rang a bell each time he fed a group of dogs. After repeating this a few times, he found that the dogs would salivate if he rang the bell, even without the presentation of food. They had become conditioned to have a physical reaction at the sound of the bell. The process of conditioning or programming seems to be very important in determining when the person with TMS will have pain. For example, a common complaint of people with low back pain is that it is invariably brought on by sitting. This is such a benign activity, one is mystified by the fact that it initiates pain. But conditioning occurs when two things go on simultaneously. So it is easy to imagine that at some point early in the course of the TMS experience, the person happens to be having pain while sitting. The brain makes the association between sitting and the presence of pain, and that person is now programmed to expect pain with sitting. In other words, the pain occurs because of its unconscious association with sitting, not because sitting is bad for the back. That is one way a conditioned response may be established. Car seats have a bad reputation, so a person expects to have pain when he or she gets into a car. Often people are programmed to have pain because of things they've heard or things they've been told by a practitioner. Never bend at the waist means the onset of pain is a sure thing when they bend from then on, although it may never have caused pain before. Someone says that sitting compresses the lower end of the spine. So, of course, it's got to hurt when you sit. Standing in one place, lifting, carrying, all have a bad reputation and will quickly be conditioned into a patient's pattern. Many people report that the pain is relieved by walking. Others say that walking brings it on. Some have a great deal of pain at night and cannot sleep. One man worked hard all day long with a fair amount of heavy lifting and never a twinge of pain. Every night he would wake up about 3 a.m. with severe pain that persisted until he got out of bed. Clearly a conditioned reaction. Others report that they sleep well, but develop pain as soon as they wake up and get out of bed. In these patients, the pain usually increases in severity as the day goes on. Based on history and physical examination, all of these people have TMS, but are programmed to believe they suffer from something else. What gives strong support to the idea that these reactions are conditioned is that they disappear within a few weeks as patients go through my treatment program. If they were structurally based, they would not go away after treatment consisting primarily of lecture seminars but this is what happens with successfully treated patients. The conditioning is broken by the educational process. One cannot overemphasize the importance of conditioning in TMS, for it explains many of the reactions that patients don't understand. If someone says, 
I can lift a very light weight, but anything over five pounds will cause pain. The pain can't be based on structural grounds. Or this example. A woman who could bend over and touch her palms to the floor without pain, but told me she always felt pain when she put her shoes on. Many of these condition responses stem from the fear that people develop when they have back pain, especially in the low back. They have been told and they have read that the back is fragile, vulnerable, and easily injured. So if they try to do something vigorous like jog or swim or vacuum a carpet, their backs begin to hurt. They have learned to associate activity with pain. They expect it, so it happens. That is conditioning. The specific posture or activity that brings on the pain is not important per se. What is essential is to know that it has been programmed in as part of the TMS and is, therefore, of psychological rather than physical significance. Perhaps the most common pattern is for the person to have recurrent acute attacks of the kind I've described. These may last from days to weeks or even months, with the most acute pain subsiding after a few days. They are traditionally treated with bed rest, painkillers, and anti-inflammatory drugs. If the patient is hospitalized, traction is often employed, though its purpose is to immobilize the patient and not to pull the spinal bones apart, since this could not be done with the weights used. I do not instruct my patients what to do for an acute attack, for it is the goal of this program to see that the attacks don't occur, to prevent them. However, occasionally I am called upon to advise someone having an acute attack. As I stated earlier, it's essentially a question of waiting it out. I may prescribe a strong painkiller, but not an anti-inflammatory drug since there is no inflammation. The irony of the usual experience with one of these attacks is that most patients would be better off if they consulted no one. This is unwise, however, because every once in a while there may be something physiologically important going on, and so one must be examined by a physician. Assuming nothing truly serious like a tumor is present, the usual diagnosis is some spinal structural abnormality. A scary diagnosis, such as degenerative disc disease, herniated disc, arthritis, spinal stenosis, or facet syndrome, plus the dire warnings of what will happen if the patient doesn't take sufficient bed rest, and cautioning about never again jogging or using a vacuum cleaner or bowling or playing tennis, this is the perfect combination for multiplied and persistent pain. But the human spirit is more or less indomitable, and eventually the symptoms fade, leaving someone who is essentially free of pain but permanently scarred, not physically, but emotionally. Except for the very brave few, most people who have had such an attack never again engage in vigorous physical activity with an easy mind. They have been sensitized by the experience and all that it is supposed to imply, and they see themselves, to a greater or lesser degree, as permanently altered. They fear another attack, and eventually it comes. It may be six months or a year later, but the prophecy is fulfilled and the dreaded event occurs again. As before, the person usually attributes the attack to some physical incident. This time, there may be leg pain as well as back pain, and now there is talk of surgery should a herniated disc be found. This pattern of recurrence of acute attacks is very common. As time goes on, the attacks tend to come more frequently, to be more severe, and to last longer. And with each new attack, the fear increases, and there is an increased tendency to limit physical activities. Some patients become virtually disabled. In my view, physical restrictions and the fear of physical activity represent the worst aspect of these pain syndromes. They are ever-present, though the pain may come and go.
They have a profound effect on all aspects of life, work, family, leisure time. Indeed, I have known patients with TMS who are much more disabled in terms of their daily lives than patients who are paralyzed in both legs. Many of the latter go to work every day on their own, raise families, and in every way lead normal lives, except that they are in wheelchairs. A severe TMS patient may have to stay in bed most of the day because of the pain. Eventually, most people who have recurrent attacks will develop a chronic pattern. They will begin to have some pain all the time, usually mild, but exacerbated by a variety of activities or postures to which they have become conditioned. The kinds of statements I hear are, I can lie on my left side, but not on my right. I must always have a pillow between my knees in bed. I never go anywhere without my seat cushion. My neck collar is absolutely essential if I am to remain free of pain. If I sit for more than five minutes, I get severe pain. The only chair I can sit on has to have a hard seat and a straight back, and on and on and on. To some, the pain becomes the primary focus of their lives. It is not uncommon to hear people say that the pain is the first thing they are aware of when they awaken in the morning and the last thing they think about when they go to sleep. They become obsessed with it. There is great variety in the manifestations of TMS. There are those who have a little pain all the time with varying degrees of physical restriction. Others have occasional acute attacks, but live essentially normal lives in between with little or no restriction. What I have been describing are the most common manifestations of TMS and the most dramatic, those in the low back and legs. However, a severe episode involving the neck, shoulders and arms can be very dramatic too, and just as physically restricting. To summarize, TMS may involve postural muscles, nerves that are in and around those muscles, and a variety of tendons and ligaments in the arms and legs. In the involved areas, the patient has pain, possibly feelings of pins and needles, and or weakness. There are many different patterns and locations of symptoms and considerable variation in severity ranging from mild annoyance to almost total disability. Recurrent attacks, fear of recurrence and physical activity, and failure to find successful treatment characterize TMS. The symptoms of pain, numbness, tingling, and weakness are intended by the brain to suggest that something is physically wrong. To most people, practitioners and laymen alike, physically wrong means injury, weakness, incompetence, and degeneration, singly or in combination. To further this view of the symptoms, the pain often begins in association with some physical activity. The more vigorous, the better. The patient can't help but conclude that something has been injured or displaced. My back went out, is a common description of the event. Also very important to advancing the idea of structural incompetence is the powerful tendency for people to become programmed to fear a variety of simple, common things like sitting, standing in one place, bending and lifting. The net effect of symptoms, fears, and alterations in lifestyle and daily activities is to produce someone whose attention is strongly focused on the body. That is the purpose of the syndrome, to create a distraction so that undesirable emotions can be avoided and kept down. It seems a heavy price to pay, but then the inner workings of the mind are not really known, and we can only suspect its deep aversion to frightening painful feelings. Neck, shoulder, and back pain syndromes are not mechanical problems to be cured by mechanical means. They have to do with people's feelings, their personalities, and the vicissitudes of life. If this is true, the conventional management of these pain syndromes is a medical travesty. Traditional medical diagnoses focus on the machine, the body, while the real problem seems to relate 
to what makes the machine work, the mind. TMS is characterized by physical pain, but that acute discomfort is induced by psychological phenomena rather than structural abnormalities or muscle deficiency. This is an exceedingly important point, and I will soon clarify just how this works. But first, a few definitions to be sure that the terms are clear. Tension is a word that is widely used and means different things to different people. In my work and in this audio program, the disorder is called the tension myositis syndrome. The word tension is used here to refer to emotions that are generated in the unconscious mind and that, to a large extent, remain there. These feelings are the result of a complicated interaction between different parts of our minds and between the mind and the outside world. Many of them are either unpleasant, painful, embarrassing, or even dangerous, and therefore unacceptable to us and or society, and so we repress them. Examples of such feelings are childishness or selfishness, low self-esteem, or feelings of inferiority. They are repressed because the mind doesn't want us to experience them, nor does it want them to be seen by the outside world. It is likely that if given a conscious choice, most of us would decide to deal with the bad feelings. But as the human mind is presently constituted, they are immediately and automatically repressed. One has no choice. To sum up, the word tension will be used here to refer to repressed, unacceptable emotions. The word stress is often confused with tension and seems to stand for anything that is emotionally negative. I like to use it to refer to any factor, influence, or condition that tests, strains, or in any way puts pressure on the individual. We can be stressed physically or emotionally. Excessive heat or cold are physical stressors. A demanding job or family problems are emotional ones. The stress involved in TMS leads to emotional reactions that are repressed. Stress can be either external or internal to the individual. Examples of external stress are your job, financial problems, illness, change of job or home, caring for children, or parents. However, the internal stressors appear to be more important in the production of tension. These are one's own personality attributes, like conscientiousness, perfectionism, the need to excel, and the need to be good. People often say they have a very stressful job, and that's why they're tense. But if they weren't conscientious about doing a good job, if they weren't trying to succeed, achieve, and excel, they wouldn't generate tension. Often such people are highly competitive and determined to get ahead. Typically, they are more critical of themselves than others are of them. A homemaker and mother with a similar personality stresses herself in the same way as someone in the work world. But the focus of her concerns is the family. She worries about her children her husband, her parents. She wants the best for everyone and will do everything in her power to bring it about. She may also tell you that it is important to her that everyone like her, that she gets very upset if she feels that anyone is displeased with her. Stress, then, is outside what one might call the inner core of the emotional structure and is composed of the stresses and strains of daily life and, more importantly, aspects of one's own personality, and stress leads to tension, repressed, unacceptable feelings. Now let's take a closer look at the personality. The part of your personality that you're aware of resides in the conscious mind. It's the realm of emotions you can feel. You feel sad, glad, exhilarated, depressed. You also know that you are conscientious, hard-working, a worrier, perhaps compulsive and perfectionistic. 
you may realize that you are often irritable, or you are aware of having a need to assert yourself. A man may have strong feelings of masculine superiority and be aware of it, indeed proud of it. These make up the conscious you, and they seem to determine what we do in life and how we conduct ourselves. But do they? Often these outward characteristics reflect inner drives of which we may be totally unaware. So it is important to look at the unconscious mind, as we shall do in a moment. The word unconscious has an unfortunate other use, that is, to be out of contact as in sleep or when brain damaged. However, it is firmly entrenched in the psychological literature as referring to that part of emotional activity of which we are usually unaware, and we should therefore use the word when discussing emotions. We would probably be more comfortable with the word subconscious, but it is not accurate to use it in this discussion. The unconscious is subterranean, the realm of the hidden and mysterious, and the place where all sorts of feelings may reside, not all logical, not all nice and some of them downright scary. We get some hint of the kinds of things that inhabit the unconscious from our dreams. Someone said that every night when we go to sleep, we all go quietly and safely insane, because that's when the remnants of childish, primitive, wild behavior that are part of everyone's emotional repertoire can show themselves without being monitored by the waking conscious mind. The unconscious is the repository of all of our feelings, regardless of their social or personal acceptability. To know about the unconscious is extremely important, for what goes on down there may be responsible for those personality characteristics that drive us to behave as we do when we're awake. And the unconscious is where TMS and other disorders like it originate. To better understand how and why TMS gets started, it's essential to look at some of these unconscious emotional processes. I find it almost shocking to realize how common it is for people to have feelings of inferiority deep inside. I believe it is true for everyone, but in some it is worse than in others, probably because of bad experiences with parents during the growing up years. It is likely that for most of us, the compulsive need to do well, succeed, and achieve is a reflection of deep-seated feelings of inferiority. Wherever it comes from, the need to accomplish or live up to some ideal role, such as being the best parent, student, or worker, is very common in people who get TMS. A typical example was a patient who, through compulsive hard work, established a very successful business, and became the patriarch and benefactor of his large family. He enjoyed the role, but felt the responsibility deeply. Throughout his entire adult life, he had low back pain, which resisted all attempts at treatment. By the time I saw him, the pain patterns were deeply ingrained and part of his everyday life. He understood the concept of tension-induced pain, but was unable to erase the patterns of a lifetime. He felt that he was too old to engage in psychotherapy, which is often required for patients like this. The primary benefit he derived from treatment was a reassurance that there was nothing structurally wrong with his back. People who get TMS are often intensely competitive, success-oriented, achieving, and usually very accomplished. In our culture, Success often requires the ability to compete effectively, and they do. They are accustomed to putting a great deal of pressure on themselves and often feel as though they have not done enough. Often, they also feel that they have not been good enough. Sometimes the perfectionism manifests itself in unusual ways. I remember once seeing a young man who had grown up on a farm. He said that when he had read my first book, he didn't see how this perfectionism applied to him, until he realized that at haying time, he had a powerful compulsion to stack the bales of hay perfectly. At this point, 
You may be mentally scratching your head and wondering why being hardworking, conscientious, or compulsive and perfectionistic should bring on TMS. It is clear that there is a relationship between these personality characteristics and this pain syndrome, but what is it? To understand this, we need to think about anger and rage. Standing right beside the deeply buried feelings of low self-esteem is another of equal importance, narcissism. This refers to the human tendency to love oneself, that is, to be self-centered to an excessive degree. The evolution of culture in the United States seems to have produced people who are much more I than we oriented. I've heard it said that many of the American Indian languages had no pronouns for I and me because of a powerful sense of community and of being part of something larger than themselves. By contrast, contemporary North Americans believe in individualism and have great admiration for the person who goes it alone. But the other side of that coin is that the individual may become overly focused on himself, and if he is not motivated by lofty ideals, tend to greediness and avarice. Narcissism exists in all human beings to some degree. When it is strong, it can make trouble, since it means that the person is easily irritated, often frustrated by contact with others who do not do his bidding or do it badly. The result is anger, and if the person is very narcissistic, he or she may be angry all the time but never know it, because, like anxiety, it has been repressed. It's all there in the unconscious mind. Here's a seeming paradox. On the one hand, we have poor self-esteem, but then our narcissism leads us to behave emotionally like reigning monarchs. It's the story of the prince and the pauper. They are one and the same person. These diametrically different feelings are opposite sides of the same coin though it may strike us as strange that they generally exist simultaneously. How typical of the human mind! It appears to be a storehouse of often conflicting feelings and tendencies, most of which we are totally unaware of. We are angry for other reasons. In fact, anything that makes us anxious, all unconscious, will tend to make us angry as well. You're trying to do a good job. You hope it turns out well. You're anxious, but you're also resentful of the problems with which you must contend. For example, other people and their needs. You're angry. Although the production of anxiety and anger is often work-related, personal relationships are an equally common source of repressed emotions. Family dynamics often produce serious problems that may be unrecognized because of their subtlety. One of my patients was a woman in her late forties who'd had a sheltered adolescence, an early marriage, and, as dictated by her culture, thereafter had devoted herself exclusively to home and family. She did an excellent job, since she was an intelligent, competent, and compassionate woman. However, there came a time when she began to resent the fact that she had not been allowed to go to school as a child and could not read and write could not drive a car, and had been denied many experiences because the needs of her family so dominated her life. She was totally unaware of the existence of this resentment, and as a consequence developed a long, disabling history of back pain, including unsuccessful surgery. When she came to my attention, she was in constant pain and was almost totally unable to function. Through the education program and psychotherapy, she became aware of these repressed feelings, and the pain gradually disappeared. The process was not without psychological trauma, for now she was faced with the disapproval of her family and friends and her own deeply ingrained attitudes. She was in considerable conflict and now experienced emotional pain, but this was appropriate and vastly preferable to the physical pain of which she had been a helpless victim. An important source of anger and resentment, 
of which we are usually unaware, stems from our sense of responsibility to those who are close to us, like parents, spouses, and children. Though we love them, they may burden us in many ways, and the resultant anger is internalized. How can one be angry at elderly parents or a baby? A good example is the case of the young father whose firstborn turns out to be a non-sleeper. Not only does he lose sleep, but his wife is pretty much tied up with the baby around the clock. He has to pitch in during his free time. Their social life is much curtailed, and what was a long honeymoon before the baby came is now a grind. He develops back pain because he's mad at the baby. Ridiculous! And angry at his wife because she can no longer minister to his emotional and physical needs as she had before. Absurd! And to make matters worse, he has become a part-time nursemaid and cook. But he doesn't know about any of these feelings. They are deeply buried in his unconscious, and to make sure that they stay there, he gets back pain. T.M.S. There was a large group of psychologists and doctors who would put a different interpretation on the young father's plight. They would say his back hurts from lifting the baby and not getting enough sleep. They would also say that the pain is very bad because he's trying to get out of doing his part with the baby. Now he has a good excuse. Of course, they say, this is all unconscious. This is the so-called secondary gain theory of chronic pain. The trouble with it is that, first, it presupposes a structural reason for the pain, which is usually untenable. Second, it elevates to preeminence a feeling that is either minor or non-existent, that the person is deriving some benefit from the pain. Behavioral psychologists like it, however, because it's simple, and all you have to do is reward non-pain behavior and punish its opposite. There is no getting involved with messy, unconscious feelings like anxiety and anger. Years ago, before I knew about TMS, I tried this approach and found it singularly ineffective. Little wonder. It was the wrong diagnosis. All family relationships are emotionally loaded. It is one of the first things to be considered when someone has an attack of TMS that seems to come out of nowhere. The combination of real concern and love for the family member and inner resentment of the duties and responsibilities associated with the relationship are a source of deep conflict, the stuff of which TMS is made. Here is a classic story with some interesting sidelights about the natural history of TMS. The patient was a 39-year-old married man who ran a family business originally started by his father. He told me that his father was still active in the business, but that he had become a hindrance rather than a help. He admitted to conflict with his father over this and to feeling guilty about the whole thing. The pain syndrome had begun about two and a half years before, and about four months into the experience he read my first book. He decided it was hogwash and proceeded to make his way through the medical system, determined to get rid of the pain. He said he saw many doctors and tried virtually every available treatment with no success. Two years later, he was still in pain, was rapidly becoming obsessed with it, and was extremely limited physically. He was afraid of any physical activity and could not even bend. At that point, he read the book again, and reported with incredulity, it had a totally different effect on me. He said he saw himself on every page. His explanation was that he had to go through all the tests and doctors before he was ready to acknowledge a psychological basis for the pain. Needless to say, he did very well on the program and was soon free of pain. During the consultation, I found him to be so perceptive and psychologically attuned, I could not imagine that he had originally rejected the diagnosis. It was a lesson to me. One of the unfortunate realities about working with a disorder like TMS is that most people will reject the idea until they are desperate for a solution. One of the great sources of conflict in the unconscious is the battle which rages between those feelings and needs that stem from narcissistic impulses and another very real part of the mind 
that is concerned about what is appropriate, reasonable, and mature, or even more demanding with what you should be doing. The well-known psychoanalyst, writer, and teacher Karen Horney described what she called the tyranny of the should, which may dominate someone's life. Patients often describe in detail how their lives are governed by these behavioral imperatives. One woman told me, after denying that she was compulsive or perfectionistic, that she came from a family that prided itself on its strength of character and rigidity, stiff upper lip, and all that stuff. It was clear that there were other parts of her personality that were softer and more pliable, so the conflict in her unconscious must have been considerable. Sometimes the pressure to behave in a certain way comes from one's culture. I recall a strikingly attractive woman who was part of a religious group that believed in very large families. Six or eight children were not unusual. Though she acknowledged that her pain was due to tension, it persisted, and she couldn't understand why. I suggested that she might be resentful of the work and responsibility for such a large family. For a long time, she denied this, insisting that she felt no such resentment, and the pain continued, sometimes very severely. I pointed out that she would not be aware of the feeling since it was unconscious and repressed. Perseverance, both hers and mine, paid off. She began to get inklings of her deeply repressed resentment and then had a dramatic resolution of her symptoms. The longer I work with TMS, the more impressed I am with the role of anger. We have all learned to repress it so completely that we are totally unaware of its existence in many situations. In fact, I have concluded that anger is more fundamental to the development of symptoms than anxiety, and indeed, that anxiety itself may be a reaction to repressed anger. The following story made a deep impression on me. The man was in his mid-forties and, among other things, had a history of having occasional panic attacks. These represent acute anxiety. After having examined him and established that he had TMS, we discussed the psychology of the disorder. I told him that I was beginning to suspect that anger might be more important than anxiety. He said that something had just happened to him that supported that supposition. He had become extremely angry at someone and was on the point of starting an altercation when he decided that it would not be appropriate, that he had better swallow it. Within moments, he had a panic attack. He was probably more than angry. He was in a rage, and the need to repress it, both unconsciously and consciously, necessitated some kind of reaction, hence the panic attack. As we shall see in a moment, this is precisely the kind of situation that brings on TMS and other physical reactions. But first, let's consider the phenomenon of repression. Where does it come from? I remember a mother telling me proudly how she had stopped the temper tantrums in her little 15-month-old. Her supposedly, quote, wise family doctor suggested that she splash ice water in the child's face when he started to have a tantrum. It worked beautifully. He never had another tantrum. At the ripe age of 15 months, he had learned the technique of repression. He had been programmed to repress wise family doctors suggested that she splash ice water in the child's face when he started to have a tantrum. It worked beautifully. He never had another tantrum. At the ripe age of 15 months, he had learned the technique of repression. He had been programmed to repress anger because it produced very unpleasant consequences, and he would carry that dubious talent with him throughout his life. Now, when confronted with the multitude of frustrating, annoying, sometimes enraging things that happen to people every day, this man automatically internalizes his natural anger. When that anger collects and builds up, he will have TMS or some such physical reaction in response to it. The story illustrates one of the sources of the need to repress, innocent parental influence. This may be the most common reason for learning to repress. 
In an attempt to make good people of their children, parents may inadvertently induce the conditions for psychological difficulty later in life. When you think about it, there are many reasons why we repress anger, all logical and mostly unconscious. Everyone wants to be liked or loved. No one enjoys disapproval, so we repress unlovable behavior. We would hate to admit it, but unconsciously we fear reprisal. The cultural imperatives of family and society provide strong motivation not to show anger. This becomes deeply embedded, starting as it does in early childhood. We realize, all unconsciously, that anger is often inappropriate, springing from irritants which ought not to make us angry, and so we repress. Instinctively, we feel that anger is demeaning, and perhaps even more powerful, we feel a loss of control when we are angry. That is something the TMS personality finds hard to take. All of this is unconscious, and thus we are unaware of our need to repress the anger. Instead, we may experience a physical symptom, TMS, or something gastrointestinal, for example. We seem to have a built-in mechanism for avoiding what is emotionally unpleasant, which is the reason for repression. But there appears to be an equally strong force in the mind working to bring those feelings to consciousness, and that is the reason for reinforcements, for what psychoanalysts call a defense. For many years, I was under the impression that TMS was a kind of physical expression or discharge of the repressed emotions I've described. I'd been aware since the early 1970s that these common back and neck pain syndromes were due to repressed emotions. 88% of a large group of patients with TMS had a history of other tension-related disorders like stomach ulcers, colitis, tension headache, and migraine headache. But the idea of TMS as a physical manifestation of nervous tension was somehow unsatisfactory and incomplete. Most important, it did not explain the repeated observation that making a patient aware of the role of the pain as a participant in a psychological process would lead to cessation of pain, to a cure. It was a psychoanalyst colleague, Dr. Stanley Cohen, who suggested in the course of our working together on a medical paper that the role of the pain syndrome was not to express the hidden emotions, but to prevent them from becoming conscious. This, he explained, is what is referred to as a defense. In other words, the pain of TMS, or the discomfort of a peptic ulcer, of colitis, of tension headache, or the terror of an asthmatic attack, is created in order to distract the attention of the sufferer from what is going on in the emotional sphere. It is intended to focus one's attention on the body instead of the mind. It is a response to the need to keep those terrible, antisocial, unkind, childish, angry, selfish feelings from becoming conscious. It follows from this, that far from being a physical disorder in the usual sense, TMS is really part of a psychological process. Defenses against repressed emotions work by diverting one's attention to something other than the emotions that are being kept hidden in the unconscious. Patients have different metaphors to describe the process, that the defense acts as a camouflage, that it is a diversion or distraction. To be successful, it must occupy one's attention, and it works even better if you are totally preoccupied or obsessed with whatever it is. That is why physical defenses are so good. They have the ability to really grab one's attention, particularly if they are painful, frightening, and disabling. This is exactly what happens with TMS. It has been a recurrent observation of mine that the more painful the repressed emotion, the more severe the pain of TMS has been. 
The patient who is found to be harboring enormous anger as a result of childhood abuses, for example, usually has severe disabling pain. The pain disappears only when that person has an opportunity to express the terrible, festering rage that has occupied his or her unconscious for years. Another example of the potential of anger to initiate the pain of TMS. Other physical disorders may serve the same purpose as TMS. A few of the more common ones are gastroesophageal reflux, hiatus hernia, irritable bowel syndrome, hay fever or asthma, tension or migraine headaches, eczema, psoriasis, acne or hives, dizziness, and frequent urination. All of these disorders should be treated by one's regular physician. Though they may be serving a psychological purpose, they must be investigated and treated medically. Hopefully, the patient will also receive some counseling. Each of these physical conditions serves equally to assist repression. The more that practitioners identify them as, quote, purely physical, the more they assist in the defense mechanism, which means the continuation of the pain, the ulcer, headache, or whatever is going on. As long as the defense works, it will continue. Physical as opposed to psychological defenses against repressed emotions are undoubtedly the most common because they are so successful. They are also very effective since a patient can transfer from one to another. For example, excellent drugs have been found to reverse the pathology of peptic ulcer. As a result, the mind simply shifts to another physical disorder. One man in his mid-forties told me that ten years before, he had started to have trouble with his low back. After many years, it was relieved by surgery. A few months after the operation, he began to have stomach ulcer problems, and that went on for almost two years. The doctor tried a number of medications, but just couldn't get rid of the ulcer. Finally, it stopped. And shortly thereafter, the patient began to have neck and shoulder pain. It had been going on for almost two years, and so he had come to see me. The back surgery and ulcer treatment didn't alleviate his basic problem. They merely acted as placebos and mandated a shift in the location of his physical symptoms. The ulcer story is interesting. There has been a decline in the incidence of peptic ulcer in the United States and Canada over the past 20 to 30 years, due in part to the effective drugs that have been developed. For a better explanation, however, I am indebted to columnist Russell Baker, who in one of his Sunday columns in the New York Times magazine asked, Where have all the ulcers gone? Mr. Baker pointed out that people seem to be getting fewer ulcers. The article set me to speculating that since everyone, doctors and laymen alike, had come to realize that ulcers really meant tension, and since they could be treated successfully with medications, they no longer served the purpose of hiding tension, so fewer people developed them. Could this be the reason why neck, shoulder, and back pains have become so common in recent years? Is it possible that these are now much better hiding places for tension than the stomach? Severity of TMS is measured not only by the intensity of the pain, but by the degree of physical disability that exists. What things is the person afraid of or unable to do? Disability may be more important than pain because it defines the individual's ability to function personally, professionally, socially, and athletically. In the long run, fear and preoccupation with physical restrictions are more effective as a psychological defense than pain. A severe attack of pain may be over in a few days, but if the person is afraid to do things for fear of inducing another attack, or because he or she has found that the activity will invariably bring on pain, even if it is not an acute attack, then the preoccupation with the body is continuous and the defense is working all the time. In the majority of patients with whom I work, this is the most important factor. 
Occasionally, I have a patient who says that he or she has no physical restrictions, that pain is the only problem. But such patients are rare. Most patients are afraid of physical activity, which tends to perpetuate the problem by inducing further anxiety and often leads to depression as well. What one sees is truly a physicophobia, a fear of physical activity. The degree of preoccupation with symptoms is a measure of the severity of the problem. Many patients report that the syndrome dominates their lives, while others are clearly obsessed by the disorder. It is the first thing they think of when they awaken in the morning and the last at night before sleep comes. A young woman with whom I was working said one day that she was terrified of the physical pain. It was clear as we talked, however, that she was really terrified about emotional things, and the pain syndrome had allowed her to avoid them. It has been my experience that the overall severity of the pain syndrome, including obsessional components, is a good guide to the importance of the underlying emotional state of the patient. By importance, I mean how much anger there is and how severe the traumas of early life are that have contributed to that person's current psychological state. People who were abused as children, emotionally or physically, but especially sexually, tend to have enormous reservoirs of rage and shame. This is one of the first things I think of when I see someone who has a particularly severe TMS. The physical symptoms are the means by which they remain out of contact with some terrible, frightening, deeply buried feelings. Those words are not exaggerations. There is great fear and probably enormous rage festering in their minds that they dare not acknowledge. Such patients will tell you that they understand why the pain will not leave. For when they begin to get close to those buried feelings, they are panic-stricken and can proceed no further. They invariably require psychotherapy as part of the therapeutic program. On the other hand, in the great majority of people with TMS, about 85%, the anger level and the reasons for it are much milder, and they experience no emotional reaction when the pain disappears. One has the impression in these cases that the mind has overreacted to the anger, and the defense wasn't necessary in the first place. What has been described is universal in our culture. Only the degree of repressed emotionality varies. And in our culture, nature has created a mechanism whereby we can avoid being aware of those bad feelings. It gives us physical symptoms. Fortunately, there is a way of stopping what is clearly a maladaptive response for most of us. Logic tells us that the brain is reacting in an infantile fashion. However, my work with TMS has demonstrated that the brain has other attributes and can reverse the process that leads to physical symptoms. Fear is pervasive. Anything that heightens anger will increase the severity of symptoms. One of my patients reported that she left the doctor's office in a state of shock, having been told that the lower end of her spine was degenerating. She said she almost fainted in the street and that her pain was much worse after the visit to the doctor. There are many things about having back pain that stimulate fear. The American public is now convinced that the back is a fragile, delicate structure, easily injured, and perpetually vulnerable. There are dozens of do's and don'ts. Don't bend, don't lift with a straight back, don't sit on a soft chair or couch, don't swim the crawl or breaststroke, don't wear high heels, don't arch your back, don't sleep on a soft mattress, don't run or pursue vigorous sports, etc. Odd nauseam. A large group of my successfully treated patients, many thousands, have demonstrated that these are not valid instructions. All they succeed in doing is help perpetuate the pain syndrome and make life hell. There is fear of recurrent attacks. Anyone who has had a severe back attack cannot help but live in terror of the next one. Ironically, by contributing to a high level of anxiety, 
This fear almost guarantees that another attack will come sooner or later. Anger is enhanced by the perception that one is an inadequate parent, spouse, sexual partner, worker, homemaker, or whatever else you do in life. You can't go to the movies, theater, concert, or restaurant because you can't sit for long. Your woe is doubled if you are self-employed. The sad reality is that the patient with back pain is a prisoner of pervasive fear, and fear is a prime perpetuator of the pain syndrome. It is at this point that the patient will say, All right, you've convinced me. I understand why I've got this pain. Now how in the world do I change my personality, solve my problems, especially the insoluble ones, like my 90-year-old mother? How do I stop generating anger and anxiety and stop repressing my feelings? In fact, Mother Nature has been extremely kind in this instance, for the solution doesn't require any of those difficult transformations in the majority of cases. To be sure, a small number of patients will have to be in psychotherapy to recover, but they represent only 10 to 15 percent of the total. The rest will get better simply by learning all about TMS and changing their perceptions about their backs. Does it sound simple? It is, and it isn't. The word physiology refers to the way the various systems and organs of the body work. All biological systems are extremely complicated, and the higher the animal on the evolutionary scale, the more complicated the physiology. This is particularly true with TMS, because this disorder is the result of an interaction between the mental dash emotional and the physical spheres of human biology. Medical science has learned an enormous amount about the physiology of most biological systems in the last 100 years, and about the chemistry and physics of the human body, but virtually nothing is known about interactions between the mind and body, which may be of critical importance in understanding states of both health and disease. TMS appears to be a classic example of mind-body interaction, but we do not understand the chemistry, physics, or cell biology of how emotions can stimulate physical reactions, and yet they do. Here is my concept of how it works in TMS. The physiology of TMS begins in the brain. Here, repressed emotions like anger and guilt set in motion a process in which the autonomic nervous system causes a reduction in blood flow to certain muscles, nerves, tendons, or ligaments, resulting in pain and other kinds of dysfunction in these tissues. The autonomic nervous system is a subsystem of the brain that has the responsibility for controlling all of the body's involuntary functions. It determines how fast the heart beats, how much acid is secreted into the stomach for digestive purposes, how rapidly one breathes, and a host of other moment-to-moment -moment physiologic processes that keep our bodies functioning optimally under everyday circumstances or in emergencies. The so-called fight-or-flight reaction that all animals share, particularly important in lower animals, is directed by the autonomic system. In order to meet the emergency, every organ and system in the body is properly prepared. For some systems, it means total cessation of activity so that the body's resources can be mobilized to deal with the danger more effectively. Typically, most of the body's nutritive and excretory activities are shut down. The heart beats more rapidly, and blood is shunted away from less important functions so as to be available in larger quantities for systems that are crucial to escape or fight, such as the muscles. The autonomic system controls the circulation of blood and does it with the most exquisite precision. It can increase or decrease the flow of blood wherever it chooses and usually does so for good reasons. But what the system does in TMS, we have characterized as an abnormal autonomic activity. 
it has no useful purpose in the usual sense. It is not contributing to normal daily function or preparing the body for fight or flight. However, it is responding to a psychological need. But we consider what happens to be aberrant because it results in pain and other distressing symptoms. We have postulated that in TMS, the autonomic system selectively decreases blood flow to certain muscles, nerves, tendons, and ligaments in response to the presence of repressed emotions like anxiety and anger. This state is known as ischemia. That is, the tissue involved is getting less than its normal complement of blood. This means that there will be less oxygen available to those tissues than they are accustomed to, and the result will be symptoms, pain, for example, numbness, tingling, and sometimes weakness. These things happen because of the critical importance of oxygen in all physiologic processes. When it is reduced below its normal levels, one can expect a reaction that will signal that fact. What is difficult to understand is why the autonomic system should react so as to cause pain and other unpleasant symptoms when its normal function is to keep the body operating at an optimal level, regardless of what's going on around it. This is clearly highly unusual, but suggests that there must be some pressing need for the reaction. As I suggested earlier, that need is to deflect the person's attention away from those very unpleasant, often painful emotions that the mind is trying to keep repressed. It is as though the mind has decided that a physical pain is preferable to an emotional one. When viewed in this light, the process is not so illogical. How does one know that oxygen deprivation is responsible for the pain? First, Many of the body's reactions to tension and anxiety are the result of abnormal autonomic reactions. The best known is peptic ulcer, but so are spastic colitis, tension headache, migraine headache, and a host of others. Therefore, it was thought logical that the pathological physiology of TMS might also originate in the autonomic system. If the autonomics were to be involved in TMS, the best way that they could produce mischief in muscles and nerves would be through the circulatory system. The small blood vessels bringing blood to these tissues need only be constricted a bit. Less blood would reach the area, the tissues would be mildly oxygen-deprived, and pain would result. There is clinical evidence that the physiologic alteration in TMS is oxygen deprivation. It has long been recognized that heat introduced into muscle by diathermy or ultrasound machines will relieve back pain temporarily. So will deep massage and active exercise of the muscles involved. All three of these physical measures are known to increase blood flow through muscle. Increased blood flow means more oxygen. And if that relieves pain, it is logical to assume that oxygen deprivation was responsible for the pain. There was also laboratory evidence for this concept. In 1973, two German research workers reported finding microscopic changes in the nuclei of biopsied muscles from back pain patients, suggesting oxygen deprivation. For additional evidence on the critical role of oxygen in TMS, we are indebted to a group of research workers who have demonstrated in their laboratories in recent years that muscle oxygenation is low in patients suffering from a disorder known as primary fibromyalgia. A group of Scandinavian researchers were able to measure muscle oxygen content with great accuracy and found that it was low in the painful muscles of patients with fibromyalgia. What this means for the etiology or cause of TMS, as I have long maintained, is that fibromyalgia also known as fibrositis and myofibrositis, and to some as myofasciitis and myofascial pain, is synonymous with TMS. I have treated a large number of patients who came with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Their medical histories and physical examinations were consistent with severe TMS. 
As proof that the diagnosis was correct, they recovered completely. Therefore, it is reasonable to maintain that the finding of mild oxygen deprivation in the muscles of patients with fibromyalgia supports the hypothesis that the cause of pain in TMS is the same. Oxygen debt. As I mentioned earlier, TMS manifests itself in many ways, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And it is clear that what is called fibromyalgia is one of the ways in which TMS occurs. These patients are among those who suffer the most severe conditions, for they tend to have pain in many different muscles and to suffer from insomnia, anxiety and depression, as well as generalized fatigue. All these manifestations are interpreted as evidence of a higher level of repressed emotionality, primarily anger, and therefore, more severe symptoms. Most contemporary medical investigators cannot accept such an explanation since it violates their basic presumption that the etiologic explanation for physical abnormalities must be in the body itself. They cannot conceive of the idea that something like back pain might originate in the brain. And therein lies a great tragedy for the patient. For as long as this conceptual recalcitrance persists, the patient will continue to be misdiagnosed. Oxygen-deprived muscles are painful for two reasons that are known and perhaps others that are beyond our ability to comprehend. Muscle spasm is the first and most dramatic it is responsible for the excruciating pain that people experience when they are having an acute attack. However, once the attack has passed, the muscle is not in spasm. In the thousands of patients I have examined through the years, I have rarely found the involved muscles to be in spasm. The second reason is that the chemistry of the muscles may be altered. At the moment, we do not know what these alterations are, but they are painful. It is of great interest that both muscle spasm and these chemical changes can be observed in long-distance runners whose muscles suffer from oxygen deprivation. The presence of muscle pain either felt spontaneously or induced by the pressure of an examiner's hand means that the muscle is mildly oxygen-deprived. It does not mean that the muscle is, quote, tense. It needs to be emphasized that this oxygen deprivation is usually low level and does not, therefore, damage tissue. This is particularly true of muscle. The term trigger points, which has been around for many years, refers to the pain elicited when pressure is applied over various muscles in the neck, shoulders, back, and buttocks. There is some controversy over what precisely is painful, but most would agree that it is something in the muscle. Rheumatologists, who have taken the lead in studying fibromyalgia, appear to avoid using the term, probably because of its association with other diagnoses through the years. I neither use it nor avoid it, for I have concluded that these points of tenderness are merely the central zones of oxygen deprivation. Further, there is evidence that some of these points of tenderness may persist for life in TMS-susceptible people, though there may be no pain. Earlier I made the point that most patients with TMS will have tenderness at six key points. The outer aspect of both buttocks, both sides of the small of the back, or lumbar area, and the top of both shoulders. These tender points, trigger points, call them what you will, are the hallmark findings in TMS. They are the ones that tend to persist after the pain is gone. It is an important part of the physiology of TMS to know that the brain has chosen to implicate these muscles in creating the syndrome we know as TMS. Patients sometimes ask if breathing pure oxygen will relieve the pain. This has been tried and unfortunately does not help. If the brain intends to create a state of oxygen deprivation, it will do so, regardless of how oxygen-rich the blood is. Nerve tissue is more sensitive and delicate than muscle. It is likely that oxygen debt causes nerve pain, because the reduced level of oxygen threatens the integrity of the nerve, 
as it does not in muscle. In other words, muscle can withstand a lot of oxygen debt before it will be damaged, far beyond that which occurs in TMS. More sensitive nerve tissue, however, is more easily damaged, and in order to warn the brain that something is wrong, pain begins with very mild oxygen deprivation. We postulate, then, that nerve pain in TMS is a warning signal. Other nerve symptoms are common in TMS. The person may experience feelings of numbness, tingling, pins and needles, burning, pressure, and other even less common symptoms. These sensations and the pain are felt in that part of the body served by the nerve. There is much about TMS that is mysterious, and one of the most difficult aspects of the syndrome to understand is the apparent involvement of tendons and ligaments. Tendonitis of the elbow, shoulder, or knee, for example, will often disappear in the course of treatment for TMS. It must be assumed, therefore, that these are part of the syndrome. If that is so, what is the physiologic alteration responsible for the pain? It has been generally assumed that tendonitis is the result of inflammation, but there is no evidence at all that this is so. Because it is part of TMS, one is tempted to think that oxygen deprivation is at work. Though tendons have no blood vessels, they are living tissue and therefore must be supplied with nutrients and oxygen. It is reasonable to assume that the lack of oxygen is also responsible for tendon and ligament pain. Whatever the mechanism, it is clear that these structures are also involved in the charade mounted by the brain in the service of avoiding anxiety and anger. It is very important to know the tendonitis is one more part of the tension myositis syndrome. Let's review the physiology of TMS. It begins with certain emotional states that set in motion activity within the central nervous system, specifically the autonomic system. This results in local vasoconstriction and mild oxygen deprivation of certain muscles, nerves, tendons, and ligaments. This oxygen lack is responsible for the pain that is the primary manifestation of TMS and the possibility of sensory abnormalities, numbness, pins and needles, and motor deficits such as weakness or tendon reflex changes. Why the mind has chosen to implicate these muscles, nerves, tendons, and ligaments in TMS seems beyond our capacity to comprehend at this time. Indeed. It is likely that at this point in the evolution of the human mind, we are incapable of understanding how the brain works generally, how it comprehends and produces language, how it thinks and remembers, and so forth. Understanding the mechanism of TMS is just one more of the many imponderables of human brain function. Though it may be of academic interest, knowing the physiology of TMS with certainty is not essential. We know how to stop the disorder, how to, quote, cure it, for we know its real cause. The chemical and physical changes that take place in the muscles, nerves, tendons, and ligaments that result in pain and other symptoms are the consequences of a process initiated in the brain for psychological reasons. Since any alteration of normal physiology resulting in physical symptoms would serve the same purpose, it is not important to know with precision what is going on in these tissues. As we shall demonstrate in the treatment of TMS, focusing on the physiology and symptomatology of TMS is actually counterproductive, tending to perpetuate rather than alleviate the problem. Though I find the chore distasteful, it is essential to review the large number of disorders to which neck, shoulder, back, and limb pain are routinely attributed. The listener should know what these diagnoses mean to the people who make them, to the many disciplines that treat them, and to the people who are diagnosed as having them. In the course of my lectures to patients with TMS, it is made clear that it is important to know what is causing the pain and what is not causing it. 
because many of the diagnoses to be described evoke great fear, and fear is a dominant factor in worsening and perpetuating the pain syndrome. In my experience, structural abnormalities of the spine rarely cause back pain. That shouldn't surprise us, for this epidemic of back pain is very new. Somehow, the human race managed to get through the first half million years or so of its evolution without a problem. But, if the structural diagnoses are correct, something happened to the spine during the last evolutionary eye blink, and it has begun to fall apart. This idea is untenable. One suspects that these spine abnormalities have always been there, but were never blamed for pain because there was no pain to blame them for. Fifty years ago, back pain was not very common, but more importantly, nobody took it seriously. The epidemic of back pain is due to the enormous increase in the incidence of TMS during the past 30 years. Ironically, the failure of medicine to recognize and diagnose it has been a major factor in that increase. Instead of TMS... The pain has been attributed primarily to a variety of structural defects of the spine. It's essential to know that almost all of the structural abnormalities of the spine are harmless. With that in mind, let's take a look at the common conventional diagnoses. Though the back sufferer isn't aware of it, it is generally known by students of the spine that the last intervertebral disc between the fifth lumbar vertebra and the sacrum is more or less degenerated in most people by the age of 20. Discs are structures located between the bodies of spinal bones to take up the shock. They are firmly attached to the vertebral bodies above and below, and in no way can they slip. Enclosed by a tough, fibrous outer shell, there is a thick fluid inside, which is what absorbs the shock. The discs at the lower end of the spine and in the neck because of all the activity in those locations, begin to wear out at an early age, as I mentioned, some by the age of 20. Although no one knows exactly what happens, the disc gets flatter, suggesting that the fluid inside has dried up or broken through a weakened part of the disc wall, usually toward the back. This breaking through the disc wall is what is known as a disc rupture, or more commonly, a herniation. It is probably similar to squeezing toothpaste from a tube. In some cases, the fluid does not break through, but merely bulges the wall. The important question is, what harm is done by this extruded disc material, if any? The conventional idea is that the toothpaste compresses a nearby spinal nerve, thereby producing pain. If it is the disc between lumbar vertebral L4 and L5, or L5 and the sacrum, the pain will be in the leg. If in the neck, there is arm pain. The leg pain is usually called sciatica. It has been my experience that herniated disc material is rarely responsible for pain or any other neurological symptom. This is a minority opinion, but I am not totally alone. A well-known neurosurgeon and chairman of his department at the University of Miami School of Medicine, Dr. Hubert Rossimoff, has come to a similar conclusion. He did back surgery for many years and apparently bases his conclusion on observed inconsistencies and the logical fact of neurological pathophysiology that continued compression of a nerve will cause it to stop transmitting pain messages after a short time. The result is numbness. How could the herniation then cause continuing pain? Another highly respected physician and investigator who studied the problem for years, Dr. Alf Nockumsen of Sweden, concluded that the cause of back pain was unknown in the majority of cases and almost all should be treated non-surgically. My conclusion that most disc herniations are harmless is based on 27 years of treating such patients with a high degree of success, leading to the impression that the extruded material is not hurting anything. It's just there. In recent years, there have been numerous reports in the medical literature of herniated discs in patients with no history of back pain. They were discovered inadvertently on CT or MRI studies done to investigate other parts of the body. 
In order to document the large number of herniated disc patients that I have treated successfully over many years, a follow-up survey was conducted in 1987. 109 patients were interviewed by telephone by a research assistant. Their names were selected randomly from a large population of patients who were seen and treated from one to three years previously. In each case, pain was attributed to a herniated disc that could be seen on a CT scan. Based on history and physical examination, the diagnosis was TMS. All went through the usual treatment program. Of the 109 patients, 96, that is 88%, were free or nearly free of pain and were able to perform unrestricted physical activity. 11 patients, that is 10%, were improved, experienced some pain, and were able to perform restricted activity. Only two patients, 2%, were unchanged. The two patients who did not improve were found to have severe, persistent psychological problems and continue in psychotherapy to this day. These statistics make it difficult to take the herniated disc seriously. Yet each of these patients had been told that this was the reason for the pain. Thirty-nine of them had been advised to have surgery. Three had already had such surgery and most of the rest had been told that surgery might be necessary if conservative measures failed. During the years that I have been engaged in this work, I have seen the diagnosis of spinal stenosis emerge as one of the most common when there is low back pain and no herniated disc to blame. It refers to narrowing of the spinal canal, occasionally thought to be congenital, but most often a result of aging in spinal bones. Buildup of bone, in some places called osteophytes, narrows the canal. My reaction to this abnormality is based on experience with patients. Most of those I have seen, regardless of age, were found to have TMS, which allowed me to disregard the X-ray diagnosis. When stenosis is severe, the canal should be widened surgically, but I have seen very few of such cases. It is my practice, particularly with older patients, to suggest neurological consultation so that the possibility of significant impingement on neural structures can be carefully studied. If the neural picture is satisfactory and the patient has the classic findings of TMS, I proceed with confidence, regardless of what the X-ray shows. After herniated disc, a pinched nerve is one of the most common diagnoses made. Usually, when patients present with pain in the neck, shoulder, and upper limb on the same side, what is presumably being pinched is a cervical spinal nerve as it courses its way through a hole formed by contiguous cervical vertebrae, known as a foramen. And what is supposed to be doing the pinching is an osteophyte, a bone spur, or a herniated disc. The diagnosis is fraught with difficulty. It rests on exceedingly shaky concepts. Once more, the need to identify a structural cause is the problem and sometimes breeds a disturbing lack of objectivity. The following observations throw doubt on the pinched nerve diagnosis. First, these symptoms often occur in young adults who have no bone spurs and no herniated discs. Second, bone spurs are extremely common and many people who have them don't have pain. Spurs increase in number and size with advancing age, so that by late middle age and beyond, everyone ought to have neck and arm pain from them, but everyone doesn't. Third, neuroradiologists tell us the spurs would have to obliterate the foramen before compression of the nerve would occur, something one rarely sees. Fourth, the same principle applies here as with the lumbar herniated disc. Persistent compression of a nerve will produce objective numbness or absence of pain on testing. This is different from the subjective sensation of numbness that patients sometimes feel in a leg or arm. Fifth, there are numerous reports in the medical literature of large growths in the spine, like benign tumors, that often produce no pain. Most pinched nerve patients have TMS involving the muscles of the neck and shoulders, particularly the upper trapezius muscle, and the cervical spinal nerves after they have left 
the spinal bones. Four cervical and the first thoracic spinal nerves form what is known as the brachial plexus, a kind of staging area, where they are then reorganized into the nerves that go into the arm and hand. It is highly likely that the brachial plexus is often implicated in the TMS process. But whether it is the spinal nerves, the brachial plexus, or both is irrelevant, for we do not treat the disorder locally. We work on it where it begins, in the brain. Here is a striking case history that teaches many lessons. The patient was a middle-aged professional woman who developed pain in the left neck, shoulder, and entire left arm, with particularly severe pain in the wrist. She was often awakened at night by the wrist pain. To make matters worse, she realized one day that she had lost almost all movement at the left shoulder, what's known as a frozen shoulder. This is a common complication of shoulder pain. Patients apparently begin to limit movement at the shoulder, probably because of pain, without realizing that they're not moving it, and are suddenly aware that the range of motion is gone. In the absence of normal movement, the capsule of the shoulder joint shrinks, as it will in any joint in which there is restricted movement. Further, she reported that the left hand was weak, and she tended to drop things. Despite the ominous sound of these symptoms, I suspected she had TMS, and the physical examination supported the diagnosis. The patient was receptive to the diagnosis. She was familiar with the syndrome, and fit the psychological profile perfectly. She was overcommitted professionally, extremely hardworking and compulsive about her responsibilities. To my embarrassment, the symptoms did not respond to the usual therapeutic program. On the contrary, they continued to be severe for many weeks. Thinking there might be something serious going on that was mimicking TMS, I arranged for a neurologic consultation. The physical examination and all tests were normal. After many weeks, the symptoms began to subside, and as they did, we both realized why they had started in the first place and why she was now getting better. The trouble began when she was informed that she was going to lose a very important member of her research team. In anticipation of that event, an enormous amount of work had to be done, and my patient dreaded the woman's departure. Hence a great deal of anxiety, and undoubtedly a lot of deep-down anger at this unfortunate turn of events was generated. The unconscious mind is not particularly logical about such things. Total disappearance of symptoms coincided with the actual departure of the valued colleague, suggesting that with a fait accompli, there was no longer any need for the TMS. She regained full range of motion of the shoulder without benefit of physical therapy. This was a classic pinched nerve diagnosis, except that it wasn't. As the case clearly demonstrates, TMS exists in the service of psychological phenomena. To attribute symptoms to a structural abnormality is a sad diagnostic error. Facet is the technical name for a joint between two spinal bones. Like all joints, they are subject to wear and tear, and begin to look abnormal as we get along in years. It is believed that these changes cause pain in some patients. In my experience, they do not. What is generally meant when the term arthritis of the spine is used is osteoarthritis or osteoarthrosis. These refer to the normal aging changes we've been talking about. They are also referred to as spondylosis. I have not found that this is pathological, therefore not productive of symptoms. Rheumatoid arthritis is an entirely different matter. It is an inflammatory process which can strike at any joint in the body and is always painful. Transitional vertebra is a congenital abnormality in which there is an extra bone at the lower end of the spine usually attached to the pelvic bone. It often gets the blame when found in the presence of back pain. Spondylolysis is another defect in a vertebral bone, easily detected on X-ray and rarely responsible for back pain in my experience. Spina bifida occulta 
is still another congenital abnormality at the end of the spine, but in this one, there is a piece of bone missing. Once more, pain is historically but mistakenly attributed to this defect. Spondylolisthesis is an abnormality in which two vertebral bones, usually at the lower end of the spine, are not correctly aligned with each other. It is a scary-looking thing on X-ray, but I have found it to be uniformly benign. It would be imprecise to say that spondylolisthesis never causes back pain, but thus far, I have not seen a patient in whom it did. Between 1976 and 1980, two Israeli physicians reported the results of studies they had done to determine whether certain spinal abnormalities caused back pain. Their method was to compare the x-rays of people with and without a history of back pain. If people with back pain had these abnormalities more commonly, one could presume that the abnormalities might be the cause of the pain. They found no statistical difference in the incidence of degenerative osteoarthritis, transitional vertebra, spina bifida occulta, and spondylolysis between the two groups. There was a small statistical difference for spondylolisthesis. In other words, one could not attribute back pain to these disorders, with the possible exception of spondylolisthesis. Scoliosis refers to an abnormal curvature of the spine commonly seen in teenage girls and usually persisting into adult life. Its cause is unknown. It rarely causes pain in teenagers, but is often blamed for back pain in adults. I have not yet found this to be the case. The following case history is typical. The patient was a woman in her thirties who had suffered recurrent attacks of back pain since her teens. Several years before I saw her, she had experienced a severe attack at a time when she was taking care of her young children. Mild scoliosis, to which the pain was attributed, was seen on x-rays. She was told her back pain would gradually worsen as she got older. Despite this dire prediction, she recovered from that episode and did fairly well until two months before I saw her when she had a bad attack. She said it began when she was bending over and, quote, felt something snap. She was further frightened because her trunk was tilted to one side. On taking her history, I learned that over the years she had experienced a number of episodes of tendonitis in the arms and legs, occasional pain in the neck and shoulders, stomach and colon symptoms, hay fever, and severe headaches, a classic TMS patient. The physical examination was normal except for the usual tenderness on palpation of muscles in the neck, shoulders, back, and buttocks. She had no trouble accepting the diagnosis, participated in the treatment program, and was soon pain-free. She later reported that there had been no more attacks, that she sometimes had mild pain, but knew it was harmless and went about her life without fear. It is clear that scoliosis was not the source of her pain, since nothing in the treatment changed the scoliosis. It is equally clear that her personality predisposed her to a variety of benign physical ailments, including TMS. Osteoarthritis of the hip is well known among laymen because it is common and because of the dramatic surgical procedure in which the entire hip joint is replaced. The patient gets a new socket and a new ball, the head of the femur, to fit into it. This is certainly one of the great triumphs of reconstructive surgery. What necessitates this operation is the overgrowth of bone and the wearing away of the cartilage of the joint, so that it loses range of motion and becomes dysfunctional. It is also alleged that these osteoarthritic joints are painful, and that may be so in some cases. One must, however, be very careful, for I have seen a number of patients whose, quote, hip pain was clearly due to a manifestation of TMS. Just recently I saw such a case. The patient was a woman in her 60s who complained of hip pain. X-ray of the hip joint showed only moderate osteoarthritic change, to which the pain had been nevertheless attributed. But the physical examination told the tale. She had perfectly normal range of motion in the joint, and there was no pain with weight-bearing on that leg. 
the site of the pain was located about two inches above the joint and could be reproduced by direct pressure. What she had was tendinalgia due to TMS. Frequently, the pain will come from buttock muscle or the sciatic nerve involved with TMS. I can say this with some confidence because I treat these people and their pain goes away. I do not say that this is invariable, but merely that one must be alert to the possibility that hip pain is not always due to a degenerated hip joint. Chondromalacia is a roughening of the underside of the patella, or kneecap, which is no doubt the reason why it is routinely blamed for knee pain. Unlike what has just been said about hip osteoarthritis, this is a disorder that never, in my experience, causes pain. Invariably, the examination discloses evidence of TMS tendinalgia of one or more of the many tendons and ligaments that surround the knee. The pain in these cases is not knee pain, strictly speaking, for it is from outside the joint. Bone spurs are often demonstrated by x-ray and universally blamed for pain in the heel. In my experience, the spur is not symptomatic and the pain is usually due to TMS tendinalgia. Muscular rheumatism, chronic aches and pains, disturbed sleep, and morning stiffness affect a few million people in the United States, most of them women between the ages of 20 and 50, and may be diagnosed as fibromyalgia. Though the diagnosis of fibromyalgia is being made with increasing frequency, the cause of the disorder is still said to be unknown, and the patient is told that he or she must learn to live with the pain. For many years, it has been clear to me that this disorder is one of the many variants of TMS. The manifestations tend to be severe and are often accompanied by anxiety or depression. But, as I have said so many times in this program, many doctors have a visceral inability to accept such a concept. Psychogenic is a dirty word. It's what you call something if you can't figure out what it is. They cannot conceive of the possibility that emotions can cause bodily changes. Doctors generally say they are not sure what causes fibromyalgia, but a laboratory abnormality has been identified in this disorder. It is oxygen deprivation. The trouble is that having identified a physiologic alteration, the doctors don't know what to do with the information, though they try mightily to explain it on physical and chemical grounds. Fibromyalgia is TMS. I have seen and treated hundreds of people with these symptoms over the years. As I've stated, they suffer more severely than the average patient with TMS and often require psychotherapy. A bursa is a structure designed to protect underlying bone in a place where there is a lot of pressure. There are two locations where pain is often attributed to an inflammation in the bursa, the shoulder and the hip. Medically, these are known as subacromial bursitis and trochanteric bursitis. The shoulder is a complicated joint where there are many things that may go wrong and cause pain. What I find most frequently is that the painful structure is a tendon passing above the bursa at or near the point of the tendon's attachment to the bone. Hence, the cause of the pain is a tendinalgia, not bursitis, and like most tendinalgias, is due to TMS. Thus, both the anatomy and pathophysiology are wrong in many cases of TMS when the pain is attributed to subacromial bursitis. Shoulder pain is also commonly attributed to a rotator cuff tear. It is understandable when this happens to a professional athlete but such abnormalities are often the result of the wear and tear of aging and are not painful. Similarly, pain around what one might call the point of the hip, the trochanter, is usually ascribed to bursitis, but in my experience is again a tendinalgia of TMS origin. In the group of disorders referred to as tendinitis, the tendon is correctly identified as the offending part but the reason given for the pain is incorrect. 
The anatomy is right, but the diagnosis is wrong. It is generally assumed that the painful tendon is inflamed because of overuse. So the treatment is to immobilize and rest the part and or inject the tendon with a steroid, cortisone. Relief is often only temporary. Many years ago, the suspicion dawned on me that tendonitis, more properly called tendonalgia, might be part of TMS when a patient reported that not only had his back pain resolved with treatment, but his elbow had ceased to hurt. I put this to the test and indeed found that I could get resolution of most tendonalgias. I now consider tendon slash ligament to be the third type of tissue involved in TMS. Common sites of tendonalgia are the shoulder, elbow, wrist, hip, knee, ankle, and foot. Coccidinia refers to pain deep in the midline crease between the buttocks. It is generally assumed that the tail end of the bone, the coccyx, is the source of pain, though it is quite clear that often the area involved is the lower end of the sacrum. Whether it is coccyx or sacrum, the symptom is usually a mystery to the diagnostician since nothing is seen on X-ray. Commonly, patients will relate it to a hard fall, usually in the distant past. Coccidinia is a frequent manifestation of TMS and is probably a tendonalgia since muscles attach to the sacrum and coccyx all along their length. Proof? It disappears with the talking treatment. Another TMS tendonalgia attributed to something else is found in the forepart of the bottom of the foot. Pain is usually in the metatarsal region and is almost always blamed on a neuroma which is a benign tumor. The pain goes with TMS treatment. The pain in plantar fasciitis is located on the bottom of the foot along the length of the arch. Although they are often vague about cause, doctors may ascribe this pain to inflammation. The area is usually very tender to palpation and seems quite clearly to be a manifestation of TMS. Mononeuritis multiplex is another descriptive diagnosis, for the cause is frequently unknown. It refers to nerve symptoms that appear to affect many nerves in a random pattern. It can occur with diabetes, but many people who have it are not diabetic. In my view, it is often an example of TMS neuralgia. Because TMS tends to involve so many different muscles and nerves in the neck, shoulders, and back. Temporomandibular disorder, or TMD, is a very common painful condition of the face that has historically been attributed to pathology of the jaw joint, or TM joint, and therefore has been in the dental domain. I have never treated this disorder specifically, but I'm strongly inclined to think that it is similar in cause to tension headache and TMS. TMS patients who come in for neck and shoulder pain frequently give a history of TMD, and the jaw muscle is tender to palpation, just like the shoulder, back, and buttock muscles. Inflammation must be discussed, for it is the explanation presented for many cases of upper and lower back pain, and is the basis for the prescription of both steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as cortisone, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen. Because of the magnitude of the back pain problem, these medications are widely used. Experience with the diagnosis and treatment of TMS makes it clear that the source of the pain is often neither spinal structures nor inflammation. An inflammatory process is an automatic reaction to disease or injury is basically a protective healing process. The response to an invading bacteria or virus is an inflammation. If that's what an inflammatory process is, what is going on in the back? Is it an infection, a response to a back injury, or what? No satisfactory scientifically supported answer has ever been given. I have suggested in this audio program that the source of the pain is mild oxygen deprivation and not inflammation. 
This idea has at least a modicum of support from the rheumatologic studies on fibromyalgia. The term sprain should be restricted to clear-cut instances of minor injury like turning the ankle. I am not sure what a strain is supposed to be. Unfortunately, both of these terms are often used when the symptom is a TMS manifestation. Having briefly reviewed these common traditional diagnoses for the varieties of pain we have discussed, let us now look at the conventional treatments employed. I once wrote that therapeutic eclecticism is a sign of diagnostic incompetence. The fact that there are so many different treatments for the common neck, shoulder, and back pain syndromes suggests that the diagnosticians are not really sure what the problem is. Of course, the patient is always given a diagnosis, usually a structural one. But subsequent management, including the use of medications, physical therapies of different kinds, manipulation, traction, acupuncture, biofeedback, transcutaneous nerve stimulation, and surgery, many of which are symptomatic treatments, suggests that the diagnoses are on shaky grounds. People with TMS need to know about these treatments so they can understand why they did or did not respond to them or why they derived only partial or temporary benefit from them. In thinking about how to review the subject, it occurred to me that the best approach might be to consider each treatment modality from the standpoint of its intended purpose. Of course, all treatments are supposed to relieve pain, but the important question is how. What is the rationale for each treatment? Before we get into this, let's discuss the subject of the placebo effect because of its crucial importance in any discussion of treatment. A placebo is any treatment that produces a good therapeutic result, despite the fact that it has no intrinsic therapeutic value. A sugar pill is a classic example. It is clear that the desirable outcome must be attributed to the ability of the mind to manipulate the various organs and systems of the body. In order to do this, the mind must believe in the efficacy of the treatment and or the treater. The key concept here is belief. The patient must have blind faith. But if he or she does, the result can be impressive. Consider the following story, which was first reported by Dr. Bruno Klopfer in 1957. It concerns a man with a fulminating cancer of the lymph nodes who convinced his doctor to treat him with a drug called cribiazin. The man had a miraculous recovery with disappearance of his many large tumors. He did well until he heard news reports of the ineffectiveness of cribiazin, whereupon he regressed to the same desperate state in which he had been before. Impressed with his response to the treatment, the doctor told him he would give him injections of a more powerful crobiazin, but this time used only sterile water. Once more, the patient responded dramatically and his tumors melted away. When the American Medical Association officially announced the decision that crobiazin was of no value, his tumors returned and he died soon after. It is clear from this case history that a placebo works on the body, not the imagination. In this instance, it stimulated a vigorous response in the immune system that was able to destroy the tumors. Based on the impression that most of the pain syndromes I see are due to TMS, I have to conclude that beneficial results from most of the treatments to be described are the work of the placebo factor. If the pain in a given case is truly the result of an injury, if some structure has been traumatized, if a period of healing is required, then treatments designed to rest an injured part are logical. They include rest in bed, restrictions on physical activity, the use of cervical collars, lumbar corsets or braces, and the use of lumbar traction, which, as I mentioned, is really designed to keep the patient in bed since the weights used could not possibly pull the spinal bones apart. The rest in bed is almost universally prescribed for patients thought to be suffering from a herniated disc. 
If, however, there is no pathological structural abnormality, if the person has TMS, the rationale is gone. Not only are these prescriptions of no value, but they contribute to an intensification of the problem by suggesting to the patient that there is something going on dangerous enough to require complete demobilization. As I emphasized earlier, even the perception of a physical rather than an emotional cause for the pain will perpetuate the symptoms. The collars and corsets used are a bit ridiculous, for they do not immobilize the part corseted. When someone reports feeling better or having become dependent on one of these, I think placebo. Pain relief is the goal of all treatments, but treatments to relieve pain are designed to take away pain per se. Generally, this is symptomatic treatment, and therefore poor medicine, unless it is administered for humanitarian purposes. The use of morphine, demerol, or other strong analgesics is certainly justified when there is excruciating pain, but not as a definitive treatment. Acupuncture appears to work as a local anesthetic. In other words, it blocks the transmission of pain nerve impulses to the brain. If one is dealing with a chronic disease for which no relief of pain can be expected, this is a good treatment. For the typical back pain patient, it can give temporary relief, but it does nothing about the underlying process, the cause of the pain. Nerve blocks are widely used, especially when pain is severe and intractable. A local anesthetic is injected and does essentially what acupuncture does. Therefore, the criticism of this as treatment for back pain is the same. Transcutaneous nerve stimulation, or TNS, depends on mild electric shocks administered over the painful area to give pain relief. Electrodes are usually taped in place, and the patient can activate the shock at will. One can say the same thing about this as for the two previous treatments. However, there is a real question whether this functions as anything but a placebo. A group at the Mayo Clinic published a study in 1978 in which they demonstrated that a placebo worked equally well. When there is prolonged relief as a result of any of these treatments, one must suspect a placebo effect. There can be no other explanation, for they do not attack the cause of the problem. To the prescribers of treatments to promote relaxation, I would put the question, to what end? What is your purpose in trying to relax the person? What do you hope to accomplish? There's considerable fuzziness about this subject in the area of pain relief. There is no question that a calm, relaxed person will experience less pain, but again we are engaged in symptomatic treatment. The basic disorder is not being treated. And how much time can be devoted each day to the relaxing exercises? I advise my patients that meditation and relaxation exercises can't hurt, but one cannot depend on them for definitive relief of pain. The specific role of biofeedback in pain relief is to produce muscle relaxation. The usual procedure is to affix small electrodes over forehead muscles, whose electrical activity, which reflects muscular activity, then registers on a gauge or screen. The subject is then instructed to reduce the gauge reading, which means the muscle has relaxed, and this in turn produces reflex relaxation in muscles elsewhere in the body. I do not prescribe biofeedback, as again, it is treating the symptom. Probably the most common treatment among those used to correct a structural abnormality is manipulation. The abnormality for which this is used is malalignment of spinal bones, and the purpose of treatment is to restore alignment. I do not believe the abnormality exists, and if it did, I do not believe it could be changed by manipulation. On occasion, dramatic relief of pain follows a manipulation, suggesting that the person is having a good placebo response. 
Patients generally return for these treatments regularly. It is likely, therefore, that they are having a placebo response which is known to be temporary. Though not as common as manipulation, surgery to remove extruded intervertebral disc material is frequently performed. Without question, such procedures are often essential. It is my impression, however, based upon my experience with patients with herniated discs, that the extruded disc material is often not responsible for the pain. Needless to say, the physicians who perform these operations do so with the sincere conviction that an offending substance is being removed. This is the concept that governs the decision to do surgery, and it is widely held. Nevertheless, because of my therapeutic experience, I am forced to the conclusion that surgery may sometimes produce a desirable result because of the placebo effect. The strength of a placebo, meaning its ability to achieve a good and permanent effect, is measured by the impression it makes on the person's mind. This is why surgery is probably a very powerful placebo. Cervical traction, which can actually distract or pull apart the cervical bones to a slight degree, is another attempt to alter a structural abnormality. In this case, to try to make the cervical foramina larger. These are the holds formed by two spinal bones through which the spinal nerves make their way. The idea is to make the holds larger, so the nerves won't supposedly be, quote, pinched. But as I have said before, the idea that they are being pinched is usually fantasy, and once again, there is much ado about nothing. For years, the doctrine of strengthening back and abdominal muscles to protect the back or relieve it of pain has been preached across the length and breadth of the land. It is an idea that is deeply ingrained in the American mind, and it is dead wrong. Programs are taught in the YMCA, exercises prescribed by thousands of doctors, and people are trained by a large variety of therapists. There is nothing wrong with doing these exercises and strengthening these muscles. It's a very good thing. But I tell my patients they will neither make your pain go away nor protect you from it. And if they do you are having a placebo effect. What about using exercise to get you going, to break your fear of physical activity? That is a very different story and a very good use for exercise. There are a number of physical treatments that will increase the flow of blood into an area by increasing the temperature of the tissue. For example, heat can be generated within muscle by the use of short wave or ultrasonic radiation. Deep massage and active exercise will do the same thing. Contrary to what will increase the flow of blood into an area by increasing the temperature of the tissue. For example, heat can be generated within muscle by the use of short wave or ultrasonic radiation. Deep massage and active exercise will do the same thing. Contrary to what one might expect, a hot pack will not increase blood flow since the heat does not penetrate the skin, let alone reach the muscle. Paradoxically, an ice pack may increase it by stimulating a reflex response to the cold. But what does one accomplish by doing this? Unless the pain is somehow the result of decreased blood flow or reduced oxygenation resulting from some other mechanism, increasing available oxygen is of no value. As you are aware, it is our hypothesis, now supported by rheumatology research, that oxygen deprivation is precisely the mechanism of TMS muscle pain. Nevertheless, I do not use these therapeutic modalities because they are only of temporary value and because they are physical. The use of radiation, these days mostly ultrasonic, the application of hot or cold packs, deep and superficial massage, and active exercise are widely used in the treatment of pain syndromes almost regardless of presumed etiology. For example, a diagnosis of herniated disc is made, but it is decided that surgery is not warranted. 
In that case, after a period of rest in bed, physical therapy will often be prescribed if pain continues, usually consisting of deep heat, massage, and exercise. It is difficult to understand what this is intended to do. It will not change the anatomical status of the extruded disc material. It will temporarily increase blood flow and may tone up muscles, but to what end? As one who wrote this prescription perhaps thousands of times many years ago, I must confess that the rationale was often fuzzy and there was not a little wishful thinking involved. I would think, do something and maybe the pain will go away. Strengthen the abdominal and back muscles to support the spine. Relax the muscles, and so forth. If the physical therapist was particularly talented, the results were often very good. Alas, here again was the placebo response at work, meaning that the result was usually not permanent. However, if the therapist remained available to the patient, another round of therapy might result in pain relief for a few more weeks or months but the patient continued to live a life circumscribed by many prohibitions and admonitions and the always present fear of a recurrence of pain. My immediate response to any treatment to combat inflammation is, what inflammation? To the best of my knowledge, no one has ever demonstrated the existence of an inflammatory process in any back pain syndrome, and yet, Enormous amounts of steroidal and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication are used in treatment, both prescription and non-prescription. Judging the efficacy of these drugs is a bit difficult, because most of them have analgesic or pain-killing abilities as well. Since there is no inflammation in TMS, one must assume that improvement with these is due either to their pain-killing function or the placebo effect with one exception. Steroids, so-called cortisone drugs, will reduce or banish the symptoms of TMS temporarily in many patients. I do not know how or why this happens. I see these people when the pain returns. They have TMS, and they usually respond to treatment with permanent resolution of symptoms. It bears repeating here that treating chronic pain is not medically sound. Pain is a symptom like fever. It has been elevated to the status of a separate disorder on the hypothesis that certain psychological factors cause the patient to exaggerate the pain. As I stated before, this theory requires that one acknowledge the continuing presence of a structural reason for the pain, which is then exaggerated. In my experience, in both the mild and the severe, the acute and the chronic pain syndromes, in the majority of patients, it is the physiologic changes characteristic of TMS that are responsible for the pain and not a structural abnormality. These physiologic alterations result in pain and other symptoms. To treat those symptoms is no wiser than treating the fever in someone with pneumococcal pneumonia. Where did this chronic pain theory come from? The problem originated with the failure of physicians to accurately diagnose the reason for the pain. Then, when it became severe, chronic, and disabling, they threw up their hands and hoped that someone would relieve them of the burden of caring for these patients. Physicians were happy to shift the responsibility when the behavioral psychologists came along with the theory that psychological needs created a brand new disorder which they called chronic pain. Pain was elevated to the status of a disease by psychological fiat when frustrated physicians abrogated their appropriate role as diagnosticians. Pain is, has been, and always will be a symptom. If it becomes severe and chronic, it is because that which is causing it is severe and has gone unrecognized. Chronicity, in the case of these pain syndromes, is a function of faulty diagnosis. Here's a case history that makes this clear. The patient was a middle-aged woman with a grown-up family. She'd been essentially bedridden for about two years when she came to our attention. She had suffered from low back and leg pain for years, had been operated on twice, and had gradually deteriorated to the point where her life was restricted almost entirely 
to her upstairs bedroom. She was admitted to the hospital, where we found no evidence of a continuing structural problem, but severe manifestations of TMS. And no wonder, for the psychological evaluation revealed that she had endured terrible sexual and psychological abuse as a child. She was in a rage, to put it mildly, and had no awareness of it. She was a pleasant, motherly sort of woman, the kind that would automatically repress anger, and so it festered in her for years, always kept in check by the severe pain syndrome. Her recovery was stormy, for as the details of her life came out and she began to acknowledge her fury, she experienced a variety of physical symptoms, cardiocirculatory, gastrointestinal, allergic, but the pain began to recede. Group and individual psychotherapy was intense. Fortunately, she was very intelligent and grasped the concepts of TMS quickly. As the pain reduced, the staff helped to get her mobile again. Fourteen weeks after admission, she went home, essentially free of pain and ready to resume her life again. This woman did not have the disease chronic pain. She had a physical disorder, TMS, induced by fearful psychological trauma. What a disservice to her if it had been implied that her pain was so great and persistent because she was deriving psychological benefit from it. Thus, just one example of why I am opposed to this concept. And as well, this example may explain my insistence that the treatment of TMS requires an educational psychotherapeutic approach. Most patients do not need psychotherapy, but they do need to know that all of us generate and repress bad feelings and that these feelings may be the cause of physical symptoms. My treatment of TMS has evolved over the past 27 years in response to a clear-cut diagnostic concept, that the pain syndromes are the result of the mind-body interaction. When it began to dawn on me that this was the case, my automatic reaction was to explain to the patient what I thought was going on. At the same time, I prescribed physical therapy for everybody, as I had always done. My reasoning was that such therapy could not hurt, and since I believed that oxygen deprivation was responsible for the symptoms, it might actually be beneficial. Since all the modalities I prescribed tended to increase the local circulation of blood. As time went on, something interesting emerged. I found that most of the patients who got better were those who accepted the idea that their pain was the result of emotional factors. Some who improved remained skeptical of the diagnosis, but responded well to the physical therapy. It was also apparent that some physical therapists were more successful than others. Based on these observations, two therapeutic conclusions were reached. One, the most important factor in recovery is that the person must be made aware of what is going on. In other words, that the information provided is the penicillin for this disorder. Two, some patients will respond to physical therapy and slash or the physical therapist with a placebo reaction. A placebo reaction is fine, but it is usually temporary. Our goal was to effect a complete and permanent cure. The effectiveness of the placebo reaction was easy to understand, but I was mystified by the obvious importance of informing the patient of what was going on. This was knowledge therapy, and it appeared to make no sense at all. However, I was delighted with its effectiveness, and my cure rate was distinctly better. In addition, I finally had the feeling that I knew what was going on, despite my inability to explain all the details. That wasn't too upsetting, for after all, we were dealing with a process of the brain, and it is common knowledge that little is known about how the brain works. During this period, I worked closely with a group of talented physical therapists who had learned all about the tension myositis syndrome and combined their physical treatment with discussion of the psychological factors involved. They functioned as surrogates for me, as well as physical therapists. 
It was a painful decision to stop using physical therapy later on because I so appreciated the work of these dedicated professionals. Also, during those early years, I developed a close working relationship with a small group of psychologists on the staff of the Howard A. Rusk Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine, an association that has continued to this day. I learned a lot of psychology from them, and they have played an important role in the treatment of those patients who need psychotherapy in order to get better. In essence, we function as a team. In 1979, perhaps later than I should have, I began to bring groups of patients together for what one might call lecture discussions. With each passing year, it became increasingly obvious that educating the patient about TMS was the crucial therapeutic factor. Occasionally, I would see a patient who had been psychoanalyzed or had been in psychotherapy for a long time, but had a pain syndrome nevertheless. So it was clear that psychological insight was not sufficient to prevent TMS. It wasn't until patients learned the facts about TMS that the pain went away. Starting with four one-hour lectures, we evolved to two two-hour sessions, the first of which is devoted to the physiology and the diagnosis of TMS, and the second to the psychology of TMS and its treatment. The reason for the lectures was clear. If the information was so important to patients' recovery, then they had to be well-educated about TMS. More specifically, it was essential that patients knew exactly what they didn't have, all the structural diagnoses, and what they did have, TMS. From a strictly physical point of view, TMS is harmless. Therefore, they had nothing to worry about physically. All the prohibitions and admonitions were unnecessary. Indeed, they actually contributed to the problem by creating fear where none was appropriate. If the purpose of the pain is to make one focus on the body, and through these lectures the patient can be convinced to ignore the bodily symptoms and think about psychological things instead, haven't we made the pain syndrome useless? It's a bit like blowing the cover on a covert operation. As long as the person remains unaware that the pain is serving as a distraction, it will continue to do so, undisturbed. But the moment the realization sinks in, and it must sink in, for mere intellectual appreciation of the process is not enough, then the deception doesn't work anymore. Pain stops, for there is no further need for the pain and it's the information that gets the job done. If I can convince the conscious mind that TMS is not serious and not worthy of its attention, better yet, that it is a phony, a charade, and that rather than fear it, one should ridicule it. If I can convince the conscious mind that most of the structural diagnoses are not valid and that the only things worthy of one's attention are the repressed feelings, what has been accomplished? We will have made the TMS useless. It will no longer have the ability to attract the attention of the conscious mind. The defense is a failure. The cover is blown. The camouflage is removed. Which means the pain ceases. If that all sounds like something out of science fiction or Grimm's fairy tales, one can only say that it works and has worked in thousands of people over the last 27 years. Here's a striking story to illustrate the point. A woman from out of town went through the program and had a good result. Within a few weeks after the lectures, her pain was gone, and she resumed all her old activities, including tennis and running. One day, about nine months after completing the program, she was out running and developed a pain in a new location the outer aspect of one of her hips, another manifestation of TMS. She phoned me and told me that she saw her local doctor who said she had bursitis in the hip. He put her through x-rays, injections, and medication. While talking to me, she admitted that she was in a lot of pain and had been for three weeks, and that I was right to scold her for not calling me. 
In a later call, she informed me that after talking to me, she stood for several minutes reflecting, and she got mad, really angry at herself, and especially at her brain for having pulled that stunt. And she ended up having quite a talk with her brain. Within two minutes, the pain was totally gone and had not recurred. Amazed at how quickly her pain disappeared, she began to jog again, concentrating on the real problem, unconscious anxiety about hurting herself during exercise. The point of this story is that the information was the crucial factor, and that it worked so quickly because she had already been through our program and had integrated, meaning she had accepted at a deeper level, the concepts of TMS. The pain would not have disappeared instantly if she had not already known about TMS. But because she did know about it, because she had been through the lecture program, the moment she realized that the hip pain was another manifestation of TMS, it disappeared. Why? Because it could no longer successfully hold her attention as a legitimate physical disorder and could no longer distract her from the world of her emotions. But then you might ask, why did she have a recurrence of pain at all? The occurrence of pain in TMS always signifies the presence of repressed anger, usually to the point of rage. Then you might ask, but your program is supposed to prevent this sort of thing from happening. What happened here? The fact that this lady developed pain in a new place tells us that her brain was still trying to use the TMS to hide her rage and prevent it from coming out. I discussed this with her, and we agreed that if it happened again, it might be wise to consider psychotherapy. The treatment program rests on two pillars. One, the acquisition of knowledge, of insight into the nature of the disorder. Two, the ability to act on that knowledge and thereby change the brain's behavior. So, one must learn all about TMS, what actually causes the pain and what part of the brain is responsible. Then one reviews the psychology of the disorder, the fact that we all tend to generate anger and anxiety in this culture, and that the more compulsive and perfectionistic of us generate a lot. What one must then do is develop the habit of, quote, thinking psychological instead of physical. In other words, I suggest to patients that when they find themselves being aware of the pain, they must consciously and forcefully shift their attention to something psychological, perhaps something they are worried about, a chronic family or financial problem, a recurrent source of irritation, anything in the psychological realm. That sends a message to the brain that they are no longer deceived by the pain. When that message reaches the depths of the mind, the unconscious, the pain ceases. That brings up an important point. Of course, everyone wants the pain to go away immediately. Patients often say, All right, I understand very clearly what you're saying. Why doesn't the pain stop? The last lines of a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay illustrate the reason why the pain doesn't disappear quickly. Pity me that the heart is slow to learn what the swift mind beholds at every turn. If we substitute the words unconscious mind for heart, the point will be clear. The conscious mind is swift. It can grasp and accept things quickly. The unconscious is slow, deliberate, not quick to accept new ideas and change, which is no doubt a very good thing. Were it not so, humans would be very unstable animals. However, at times like these, when we want things to change quickly, we are impatient with a lumbering unconscious. Well, how long does it take for the pain to go? Though I am reluctant to talk about numbers, experience has shown that the majority will have resolution of most of their symptoms in two to six weeks after the lectures. Patients are warned, however, that the time may be prolonged if they count the days or weeks or become discouraged if the pain isn't gone when they think it should be gone. Human beings are not machines, and there are many factors tending to vary the time of resolution. How strong are the repressed emotions? How much fear has the person built up over the years? 
How readily can he or she repudiate the structural diagnoses with which they came? Another useful strategy sounds silly at first, but it has great merit. Patients are encouraged to talk to their brains. So many patients reported having done this on their own with good results that I now routinely suggest it, despite lingering feelings of foolishness. What one is doing is consciously taking charge, instead of feeling the helpless, intimidated victim which is so common in people with this syndrome. The person is asserting himself, telling the brain that he is not going to put up with this state of affairs, and it works. Patients report that they can actually abort an episode of pain by doing this. Perhaps the most important but most difficult thing that patients must do is to resume all physical activity, including the most vigorous. This means overcoming the fear of bending, lifting, jogging, playing tennis, or any other sport, and a hundred other common physical things. It means unlearning all the nonsense about the correct way you are supposed to bend, lift, sit, stand, lie in bed, which swimming strokes are good and bad, what kind of chair or mattress you must use, what shoes or corset or brace you must wear, and many other bits of medical mythology. The various health disciplines interested in the back have succeeded in creating an army of the partially disabled in this country with their medieval concepts of structural damage and injury as the basis of back pain. Though it is often difficult, every patient has to work through his or her fear and return to full, normal physical activity. One must do this not simply for the sake of becoming a normal human being again, though that's a good enough reason, physically and psychologically by itself. One must do this to liberate oneself from the fear of physical activity, which is often more effective than pain in keeping one's mind focused on the body. That is the purpose of TMS, to keep the mind from attending to emotional things. As Snoopy, that great contemporary philosopher, once said, there's nothing like a little physical pain to keep your mind off your emotional problems. I now believe that the physical restrictions imposed by TMS are much more important than the pain, thus making it imperative that the patient gradually overcome them. If patients cannot do this, they are doomed to have recurrences of pain. It should be noted parenthetically that the advice to resume normal physical activity, including the most vigorous, has been given to a very large number of patients over the past 27 years. I cannot recall one person who has subsequently said that this advice caused him or her to have further back trouble. I suggest to patients that they begin the process of resuming physical activity when they experience a significant reduction in pain and when they are feeling confident about the diagnosis. To start prematurely only means that they will probably induce pain, frighten themselves, and retard the recovery process. Patients are usually conditioned to expect pain with physical activity and so must not challenge the established programmed patterns until they have developed a fair degree of confidence in the diagnosis. One of my patients, an attorney in his mid-thirties, had an interesting experience in this regard. He went through the program uneventfully, and in a few weeks was free of pain and doing everything except one thing. He was afraid to run. He explained to me later that it had been drummed into his head for so many years that running was bad for your back that he simply couldn't get up the courage to try, though he could do many things more strenuous than running. After almost a year, he decided that this was silly and he was going to run. He did, and his pain returned. Now he was at a crossroads. Should he continue to run or back off? He called for my advice, but unfortunately I was on vacation and he had to make his own decision. Wisely, he decided to bullet through. He continued to run, and he continued to hurt. Then one night, he was awakened from sleep with a very sharp pain in the upper back, but his low back pain was gone, 
Knowing that TMS often moves to different places during the process of recovery, he decided that he had probably won, and he had. Within a couple of days, the upper back pain was gone too, and he has not had a recurrence of either upper or lower back pain since that time. One has to confront TMS, fight it, or the symptoms will continue. Losing one's fear and resuming normal physical activity is possibly the most important part of the therapeutic process. Another essential for full recovery is that all forms of physical treatment or therapy must be abandoned. It is instructive to consider that I did not stop prescribing physical therapy until 12 or 13 years after I began to make the diagnosis. It took that long for me to fully break with all the old traditions in which I had been schooled. Conceptually, prescribing physical therapy contradicts what we have found to be the only rational way to treat the problem. That is, by teaching and through education, invalidating the process where it begins, in the mind. Further, it had become obvious that some patients had put all their confidence in the physical therapy and were having placebo cures, which meant that sooner or later they would be in pain again. The principle is that one must renounce any structural explanation, either for the pain or its cure, or the symptoms will continue. Manipulation, heat, massage, exercise, and acupuncture all presuppose a physical disorder that can be treated by some physical means. Unless that whole concept is repudiated, the pain and other symptoms continue. Patients are usually shocked when it is suggested that they stop the exercises and stretching they have been taught to do for their backs. But it is essential in order to establish firmly in the mind what is important. Exercise for the sake of good health is, of course, something else, and it is strongly encouraged. Another important strategy, but one which must not become a ritual, is a review of daily reminders. Patients are given a list of twelve key thoughts and it is suggested that at least once a day they set aside 15 minutes or so when they can relax and quietly review them. 1. The pain is due to TMS, not to a structural abnormality. 2. The direct reason for the pain is mild oxygen deprivation. 3. TMS is a harmless condition caused by my repressed emotions. 4. The principal emotion is my repressed anger. 5. TMS exists only to distract my attention from the emotions. 6. Since my back is basically normal, there is nothing to fear. 7. Therefore, physical activity is not dangerous. 8. And I must resume all normal physical activity. 9. I will not be concerned or intimidated by the pain. 10. I will shift my attention from the pain to emotional issues. 11. I intend to be in control, not my unconscious mind. 12. I must think psychological at all times, not physical. By the end of the second lecture discussion, it is assumed that the information about TMS has been intellectually processed. Patients are then urged to give this information an opportunity to, quote, sink in, to be integrated, to be accepted at an unconscious level. Conscious acceptance, though essential as a first step, is not sufficient to reverse the TMS. Patients are instructed to give it two to four weeks and then call me if they have not made sufficient progress. If they have not, I arrange either to see them in my office or, more commonly, attend a small group meeting composed of patients like themselves who have made little or no progress, or those having recurrences after having been free of pain for months or years. It is the purpose of these sessions to uncover the reason for the recurrence or lack of progress and to review the whole TMS process. The first thing to ascertain is that the patient understands and accepts the diagnosis. 
Let's take a theoretical patient, a 50-year-old businessman. He comes to the meeting because he hasn't improved after attending the lectures. What are some of the possible reasons? One, he accepts 90% of the diagnosis but still has some concerns that the herniated disc demonstrated on the CT scan or MRI has something to do with the pain. Two, he finds it hard to believe that this thing can go away with just an education program. Three, he accepts the diagnosis but can't get up the courage to begin physical activity. Mental impediments such as these allow the brain to continue the TMS, since the man is still engaged with his symptoms as a physical disorder. As long as he is in any way preoccupied with what his body is doing, the pain will continue. His confidence in the diagnosis needs to be built up so that he can accept the fact that he has TMS. The person sitting next to him is a 30-year-old homemaker, wife, and mother. She tells us that she is no better since the lectures, but she is not surprised because her life remains as hectic as ever. She is perpetually tired and harassed, and she never feels as though she has done as well as she should. It is pointed out to her that she will never cease being a perfectionist and a goodist, that she will always have too much to do but that the secret of getting over TMS is not changing oneself, but simply recognizing that the combination of the realities of her life and personality cause her to generate an enormous amount of anger to the point of rage. Yes, rage. She has probably never acknowledged the fact that although she adores her three little girls, she is simultaneously angry at them for what they require of her. The idea that she could be unconsciously angry at her children is outside of her experience. When she grasps the idea that the cure is in the acknowledgement of such unacceptable, unconscious feelings, the pain will cease. The man in the back row, who next raises his hand, is a 45-year-old construction foreman who came through the program three years ago and had been doing fine until last week. No pain, no physical restrictions, no problems. Then, out of the blue, he developed an acute low back spasm and is now having severe pain. If he hadn't been through the program, he would really be scared, but he can't understand why this has happened. What's going on in your life, I ask him. Nothing in particular, he says. My wife is fine. The children are well. We don't have any health or financial problems. But the occurrence of an acute spasm means that there has to be something psychological going on, because TMS is an emotional barometer. So I continue to question him, and finally it comes out that there have been problems on the job, difficulties with some of the men he supervises, and criticism from his superior. Nothing I can't handle, he says. But he doesn't realize that although he's handling it, He's generating large quantities of unconscious anger in the process. There is always important emotional activity going on below the level of consciousness, and we have no way of knowing about it unless, from experience, we learn to suspect it and anticipate it. He leaves the meeting a little wiser about how his emotional insides work. The back pain will subside, and hopefully... He will think about his inner reactions the next time he is confronted with a stressful situation. The small group meetings have proven to be a valuable therapeutic tool. Patients not only gain understanding about their own situations, but profit from the experiences of others. It's always reassuring to know that there are others going through the same thing you are. These meetings also give me an opportunity to decide which patients may need the assistance of a psychotherapist. Although about 85% of our patients go through the program without psychotherapy, some will need such help. This means simply that they have higher levels of anxiety, anger, and other repressed feelings, and that their brains are not going to give up this convenient strategy of hiding these feelings without a struggle. When someone tells me he is having trouble accepting the diagnosis, I suspect that there is resistance in the unconscious to giving up the TMS.
I recall a patient who reported that when he began to become aware of these long repressed feelings through psychotherapy, his feelings were so painful and frightening that he was reluctant to deal with them. These are not people suffering from mental illness. These are people who are leading normal, productive lives, but who have unconscious emotional baggage that they have never been aware of. Sometimes things happen in childhood that leave one with a large reservoir of resentment and anger, but the feelings are kept deeply buried because they are too scary or socially unacceptable to be allowed to reach consciousness. This tendency to repress bad feelings is universal. It's something we all do to a greater or lesser extent. It is not neurotic, or we are all neurotic. But in some, as in a person who was abused as a child, the repressed feelings may be strong. It is necessary for them to have help in recognizing that those feelings are there and in learning how to deal with them. That is the role of psychotherapy. I have great admiration for the people who go through our program. They must overcome some not inconsiderable impediments before they can get better. One of these is the skepticism and sometimes the ridicule they encounter. Another is the constant admonition, usually from family members, to be careful. Don't lift that. Don't bend over. Be sure to put on your corset. For this reason, I encourage the full participation of close family members so that they will not undermine the therapeutic process. One of the biggest problems for patients is developing confidence that they can banish this physical disorder with a learning program. That kind of thing is completely outside of people's medical experience. It is my job to convince them that it can be done. I should emphasize that I don't consider someone to have been successfully treated unless he or she is free of significant pain and is able to engage in unrestricted physical activity without fear. As I said before, the fear of physical activity may be more disabling than the pain for someone with a chronic pain problem. Virtually everyone I have seen has been a prisoner of fear, of hurting himself, of bringing on an attack, and that works even better than the pain to keep the attention focused on the body instead of the emotions. It is our job to liberate them from this pervasive fear. One of the more difficult concepts to grasp is the fact that one does not have to eliminate tension from one's life. People ask, how can I change my personality? How do I stop generating anxiety and anger? If these were prerequisites for recovery, my cure rate would be zero. It is not changing one's emotions. It is recognizing that they exist and that the brain is trying to keep one from being aware of their existence through the mechanism of the pain syndrome. That is the key point in understanding why the knowledge is the effective cure. One thing that is abundantly clear about the cause and treatment of TMS is that it is a striking example of the mind-body connection. The history of medicine's awareness of this interaction is long and checkered. Hippocrates advised his asthmatic patients to be wary of anger, which suggests that 2,500 years ago there was some appreciation of the impact of the emotions on illness. Why do contemporary physicians have trouble with mind-body concepts? I believe it is because they see themselves as engineers to the human body. According to them, health and illness can be expressed in physical and chemical terms, and the idea that a thought or an emotion could somehow have an effect on that physical chemistry is anathema. This is why my work has been so studiously ignored. I have demonstrated conclusively that a truly physical pathological process is the result of emotional phenomena and can be halted by a mental process. That is, first of all, rank heresy. Second, it is beyond the comprehension of most physicians. Nothing in their training prepared them for such an idea, and to them it smacks of voodoo. Paradoxically, thoughtful laymen are much more able to accept such an idea because they are not burdened with a medical education and all the philosophical biases that go along with it. 
Contemporary medicine is scientifically limited because it has closed itself off from further progress, being unwilling to venture out beyond the secure boundaries of its familiar technology. It ought to take a lesson from the field of theoretical physics where old ideas are constantly being revised in the light of new knowledge. Dr. H. K. Beecher was one of the first serious students of pain in the United States. In 1946, he published an article in the Annals of Surgery titled Pain in Men Wounded in Battle. For years, it was widely quoted because of its most interesting observation. During World War II, Dr. Beecher questioned 215 seriously wounded soldiers at various locations in the European theater shortly after they had been wounded. He found that 75% of them had so little pain that they had no need for morphine. Reflecting that strong emotion can block pain, Dr. Beecher went on to speculate, quote, In this connection, it is important to consider the position of the soldier. His wound suddenly releases him from an exceedingly dangerous environment, one filled with fatigue, discomfort, anxiety, fear, and real danger of death, and gives him a ticket to the safety of the hospital. His troubles are over, or he thinks they are. Unquote. This observation is reinforced by a report of the United States Surgeon General during World War II, noted in Martin Gilbert's book, The Second World War, A Complete History, that in order to avoid psychiatric breakdown, infantrymen had to be relieved of duty every so often. The report said, quote, A wound or injury is regarded not as a misfortune, but a blessing. Unquote. Here is yet another way in which the mind can modify or eliminate pain. Good spirits, a joyful attitude, a positive emotional state clearly have the ability to block or prevent pain. Just how this works, one cannot know at this time. But we do know in part how the therapeutic process in TMS works. The knowledge of what the brain is about renders the process purposeless. The abnormal autonomic stimuli cease, and so does the pain. What we have yet to discover, and it is probably beyond our mental horizons to do so at this time, is how emotional phenomena can stimulate physiologic ones. That they do is unquestionable. But for the time being, we may have to be content with Benjamin Franklin's observation, nor is it of much importance to us to know the manner in which nature executes her laws. It is enough to know the laws themselves. 